Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Brookline School Committee meeting, November 10th, uh, 2021. We are meeting on a Wednesday night because tomorrow is Veterans Day. So a thank you to all our veterans out there for their service. And that is uh, their day tomorrow. So we are meeting tonight. Recording uh, in progress. <clears throat> so we'll start right off. We have a consent agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to... Uh, Move the consent agenda. I'll move it. I'll move it. Does I have a second? Thank you, Val. Um, we will vote. Are there any questions, comments, thoughts, concerns about the agenda? I mean, yeah, the consent agenda. There's a lot of things on there. Um, Ray is here, if anybody had some questions for him. Otherwise, we'll just go ahead and vote. Any questions? Okay, not seeing any, we'll go ahead and we'll take the vote. Um, Val? Yes. Susan? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Helen? Yes. Andy? Yes. Steven? Yes. Mariah? Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I vote yes as well. So thank you for that. Uh, we're now moving on to uh, our student report. Claire is here and Claire has uh, a colleague to help her with her presentation tonight. So Claire, I'm just gonna turn it over to you. Awesome. Um, yeah, okay. So my friend Oliver will be joining me tonight. Oh, there you are. Okay, great. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. My name is Claire Gallion, and I am the student representative on school committee. As we all know, there have been huge construction projects on Brooklyn, Brookline High School in the past few years with our new beautiful science wing and soon to be opened freshman campus. In addition to construction projects, the discussion of importance of gender inclusive bathrooms has also sprung up in the past few years. But strangely, there are no gender inclusive bathrooms in the new science wing. I invited my friend Oliver Slayton, a fellow member of SWS and co-president of the GSA to talk this evening about how the lack of gender inclusive bathrooms in the new buildings has affected the student body. I will now hand off the mic to them. Hello everyone, my name is Oliver Slayton. I'm one of the presidents of the Brookline High School Gender and Sexuality Alliance and I identify as genderqueer. As I have grown up in Brookline, many obstacles um, that I have run into have come and gone, but one has remained a constant struggle, gender inclusive facilities. As I made my way through elementary school at Pierce, I was always posed with two choices, boys or girls. For many, the choice was automatic and, comes, um, and the answer came to mind without a conscious thought. For me, this choice held weight. Both options felt equally as wrong, um, but what else was I supposed to do but pick one of the two? As the student uh, government president and founder of the GSA at Pierce, I managed to get several restrooms in the buildings changed to be gender inclusive. This was a battle won, but not yet a war won. Upon arrival at BHS, I had high hopes for the supposed progressive institution, but was let down by the reality. At BHS, there is one gender inclusive restroom per floor meaning that a trip to the gender inclusive restroom may take five minutes there and back, while a trip to a binary bathroom would take two. Students lose learning time each day for simply using the restroom that feels right for them. At the old Lincoln campus, students have been facing an even more troubling reality. There is only one gender inclusive restroom for the entire building. Um, and it's in the basement. Depending on where the uh, students have their classes, students who use the uh, bathroom lose even more time. There was even a two week period earlier this year when this restroom was out of order, leaving students who needed the facility in a dire situation. This poses an obvious boundary for first year students, many of whom have been struggling to feel comfortable advocating for themselves. BHS was blessed with an opportunity to show their allyship recently with the construction of the new science wing. While the new uh, wing is filled with state-of-the-art equipment and labs, it has enormously missed the mark when it comes to being a queer-friendly space um, due to its lack of gender-inclusive restrooms. Countless students have asked me about the lack of gender-inclusive restrooms. 
when they ask um, why they were not included in construction, I cannot give them an answer without also bringing to light that at its core, this is an issue that the higher ups chose not to address. Students feel ignored, unwanted and hurt by, by what can feel like a very clear message from the town. Many administrators who I have talked to argue that the existing gender inclusive bathrooms are close enough. To them I ask, if the new science wing is meant to represent the best that Brookline has to offer its students, why have you chosen not to offer it to your queer students? I hope um, I am hopeful that the leadership in Brookline will continue to steer our momentum in a more inclusive direction with future projects, especially our freshman campus, especially uh, effectively making students education more accessible and welcoming by simply offering the proper restrooms. I'd like to pass it back to Claire to wrap up our time tonight and thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming, Oliver. Um, to finish this up, I want to reinforce the message of gender inclusive architecture as Brookline Public Schools continue to be remodeled. We are a community that has said a lot about caring for the LGBTQ community and inclusivity as a whole, and now is time to walk the walk. Actions speak louder than words. Creating safe environments for all students is an action that creates a larger sense of solidarity than words ever could. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire and Oliver, for raising this for us. Do we have any comments or questions? Yes, Helen. So thank you for your, your comments and, and uh, I appreciate that. I, I actually wanted to let you know that I just yesterday or the day before had a conversation with the uh, architects from the Pierce School about gender neutral bathrooms so that anybody can go into any bathroom um, like you do in your own house. <laughs> you close the door and you go to the bathroom. Um, so we are working on that. That's our plan for the Pierce School. It's a start. It's not, you know, great. I, I understand what you're saying about um, for the freshman campus and, I, and, you know, the STEM wing. It's hard to change things at this point. Uh, but I think we've become aware much more so, probably thanks to your, uh, what you did at Pierce when you were there. Uh, and, and made sure, because that was the first thing that uh, Ms. Yadov talked about was having gender neutral bathrooms. So, thank you. Yeah, David. I would also just like to let the community know that as recently as yesterday at the policy subcommittee meeting, we were discussing two policies of great relevance to this subject. One of them is a policy to support students who are transgender and or gender nonconforming. And the other policy involves our uh, facilities development policy, where we are going to be adding as a consideration for the annual review of our core facilities, uh, gender, uh, gender equity in our facilities, which would include uh, restrooms such as what you're describing. So this is very much in our minds and thank you for uh, bringing it up tonight for the full committee. Yes, yeah, Susan. Um, so first of all, thank you for being here as well. Um, very important issue um, for, just to add on to what Helen was saying, um, for the Driscoll project um, that was sort of baked in from the very beginning um, to have one gender inclusive bathroom for each space that there were bathrooms. So that's the other project that we've been working on. Um, for the ninth grade building, the um, 22 Tappan, um, there are gender inclusive bathrooms there. Exactly what you said, Oliver, um, was the conversation at the STEM wing, which is that there were gender inclusive bathrooms, gender, you know, for anyone who did not want to go to a male or female bathroom, um, there were, it was our understanding at the time that there were gender bathroom, gender uh, available bathrooms nearby. Um, I think there isn't really a good response to, to what you said, except that that conversation happened probably four or five years ago. And I think while it was kind of on people's radar screens, it was not as high as it needed to be. Um, but it by the time we kind of got to the STEM, but by the time we got to the 22 Tappan Wing, um, that conversation was much more advanced and same thing with the Driscoll and the Pierce project. So um, I would say that what's quite important is not only the overall advocacy, but also the policy pieces that David was just talking about because um, these architectural projects in particular take a few years to kind of, but by the time you've designed it, but to, to actually seeing it live, um, it's a number of years. So 
um, I would just say the advocacy is important and keep, <laughs> keep, keep with the advocacy um, and recognizing that as we have sort of lag times, one of the other questions that's come up is, are there renovation plans at all um, for the, the um, bathrooms in the existing um, buildings in all of our existing buildings? And I think that's part of what we're trying to think about with the policy issue, which is beyond new construction. So at any rate, it's an important issue. It's not a perfect answer. It's not a great answer on um, on the STEM building, um, but for the other three, it's kind of been baked in from the beginning. So anyway, thank you for being here and keep up with the advocacy. That's what I would say. And, and I also would just invite you, um, when the policy subcommittee is meeting, you certainly are welcome to join. Uh, if you, I know it takes up time, but uh, David is the chair of that subcommittee and uh, they, they publish the agendas in advance. And so if there are topics that are of interest to you and to GSA, uh, certainly you're invited to come and, and to listen and to participate. So thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, as I say, you're welcome to stay as long as you want, but we certainly understand if you would like to leave and get on with the things you're doing tonight. So thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Val. Um, Oliver, before you, before you leave, just following up on what David and Suzanne just said, we did have the broader um, gender equity policy before us uh, yesterday for a discussion and uh, that needs some work. That was last worked on a couple of years ago and we discussed actually engaging the GSA. Um, so we'd love to hear from, from you and, and others as we um, move forward with that and um, can share the current draft, which I think was probably online and um, we can we can all coordinate on that. So thank you again. Yeah, Susan. And not just not to put Val on the spot, but is it worth talking about the panel you're about to do on the LGBTQ youth health? Um, because this is sort of a key issue, not to put you on the spot. Do you want me to just talk about when it's happening? So I just think um, it's it just seems relevant. Yeah. If, so again, we we, we are it's doing, a priority uh, to us. Just, just sure. so they know it's a priority to us. That's all. It is a priority. So um, on behalf of the school committee, I'm I'm sitting on a panel that the Department of Public Health is putting together for um, queer youth health and um, and emotional well-being, um, particularly during the pandemic, and that's on November fifteenth, and we in invite everyone to attend. Um, someone from the GSA will be attending as a participant. Uh, so you're probably gonna hear about it at the GSA, uh, but it's a, it's a Zoom link and, and I really encourage everybody to attend so we can have a discussion. There'll be Q and A, so we really wanna hear from you uh, and uh, as, you know, as well as have that conversation. Thank you, thank you, Val. Thank you, Oliver, and thank you, Claire. We appreciate it. We are going to move on to the superintendent's report. Uh, so, Dr. Guillory, it's yours. Thank you and good evening to everyone. So great to see you all this evening. Uh, Deputy No Miller is going to pull up slides and we will take you through the superintendent's report tonight. Just give me one minute while it's pulling up. Can folks see this? Great. So tonight's uh, superintendent's report is to give you a snapshot of the, uh, the work, my work, uh, the senior leadership team's work since our last um, uh, conversation together. So I'll review for you some of the school visits, some of the community engagement. Can you go back one for me?
All right, uh, next slide, please. So our agenda for tonight is to review the school visits that we've done, look at some of the community engagement actions, look at our district themes in action, uh, an update on our social emotional learning, uh, COVID-19 health update, as well as recap uh, or reiterate um, our current um, position with uh, the Brookline uh, Police Department, as well as then introduce our spotlight on excellence. So for our recent uh, superintendent's visits, uh, we were at uh, Heath School on October 22nd, Lawrence School October 25th, Lincoln School uh, October 27th, and then Pierce School um, November 8th. And in each of these cases, uh, what I'm doing now with this round of rotations is uh, visiting classrooms, of course, uh, engaging with uh, building leaders and understanding what are the educational uh, areas of focus that uh, the schools may be working on, uh, aspects of their professional development and looking at that uh, in action. Uh, and we've also had a couple of senior team meetings uh, also out in school. So at, we were at Baker on October 26, as well as Pierce on November 2nd. And again, this is an opportunity for the senior leadership uh, to be out in buildings, um, as well as seeing what's happening there. On the horizon, we have uh, BHS, uh, November 18th, Ruff and Ridley on the 19th, and then at Runkel on the 22nd. Next slide. So one of the um, aspects of uh, the entry planning process as I've shared with you is to talk to as many uh, people as possible about uh, the public schools of Brookline. Uh, as well as engage and see our students in multiple venues. So I also have worked with Deputy No Miller, uh, as well as our out of district uh, coordinator, Kristen um, um, uh, Beaupre, I think I'm saying the name right, correctly. Um, and I had the opportunity to visit Manville School, um, which is here in Mission Hill, and then Bay Cove Academy. Uh, as well, and again, an opportunity to see the spaces that are um, that are special that are providing special education services to our students, and I'll continue making this a priority to visit those spaces. So, in this picture, you see uh, Jim Prince, uh, Dr. Prince, who's the director, and Hannah um, Servansky, who's the principal. And this visit was facilitated by uh, Dave, David Zimmer who's the public school liaison there. And then uh, certainly um, I wanna thank uh, Principal Trocky over at the Bay Cove uh, Academy for that visit as well. Next slide. Um, so I think we skipped one Casey, but it's so I'll just stay there and I can. Um, so for the elements of our themes and in, uh, in action, uh, as far as building relationship goes, um, the mass, the superintendents association, as well as the school committee association held a jo joint conference uh, last week. And I had the opportunity to attend some, a few of those sessions. And as well as yesterday, I attended the tri-county superintendents uh, meeting, which was held down in Franklin, an opportunity for superintendents to engage in professional learning. Uh, and also uh, discuss current issues that many districts are facing. As far as creating a culture of care, uh, our principals and senior staff today, earlier today, um, met to focus and actually talk about mental health. We know that's a, a current and ongoing uh, area of need uh, for everyone in our community. And so we wanted to really take time and do some deep work with building leaders as well as eliminating barriers. Um, I, I'm participating in a, a professional learning series from the MSAN consortium and uh, Brookline is a proud member of that group. For our community engagement, the slide that's in front of you here, um, these are a couple of shots of uh, some of the happenings that have been uh, going on in our community. So very excited to participate in many, many uh, events and traditions uh, here in Brookline. So certainly Lincoln, uh, Lincoln School Pumpkin Fest back at the end of October, the Lawrence School Japanese Fair um, that occurred on the 4th, and then um, Ronkel um, on the November 1st Professional Development Day um, sent their folks out on a, on a um, 
Brookline scavenger hunt. So this is a few of the team members visiting the fifth floor. So you, we have Jane Daniels, uh, who's in the picture with uh, Leslie, uh, our deputy for teaching and learning in the top photo there. And then Jane um, and Megan Walsh, who's a special educator at uh, Ronkel, uh, visit us here. And then also Florida Ruffin Riffin shared some photos. Uh, they were doing some mindfulness and yoga activities for their staff on that day. So a lot of great, um, great bodies of work are happening across the system. Next slide. And then for our social emotional learning update, we're going, we will continue um, focusing um, on forming connections. So I've sent out a message to all staff, the entire community, to slow down and get to know one another. Um, we're asking our school and district leaders to continue to collaborate and provide uh, SEL resources. And so um, uh, Casey's team has been working very hard on some of those resources in conjunction with OTL and uh, continuing to refine and streamline curriculum uh, to, that focuses on uh, areas of student development. Next slide for our COVID-19 update. Um, again, um, many, many vaccination uh, clinics are occurring and we're making sure that we remain committed to that. So uh, one was held on the 9th and another is on uh, the 17th. And then uh, town hall, um, is hosting a clinic on the 14th. And um, we are appreciative of the fact that these slots are, are filling up as quickly as they are, are being posted. So a number of folks are taking advantage of those. And the next uh, clinic um, after um, uh, these will be uh, in December. And we'll continue to look for clinics uh, in January and February. Um, next slide. So again, this is a recap. The committee has seen um, uh, this one before. So Casey, if we can go to the next one. What we want to reiterate again is that uh, while the SRO program has ended, formally ended, um, that uh, the committee as well as I are committed to working with the uh, Brookline Police Department. And in that, that means that uh, we have a number of relationships that are ongoing where police are working in classrooms uh, as guest speakers and those types of things uh, where it makes sense, those historical relationships that have occurred. And we will continue to uh, monitor um, what might be uh, needs that emerge uh, with uh, for police support. Uh, but this does not mean that police are not welcome in the schools. Police are welcome in um, some of and coming in as guest speakers and those types of things. So we want to make sure that we're clear on, on that, that there isn't a policy prohibiting uh, that relationship. Uh, and we'll continue to assess. So right now, our building leaders have indicated that the, the resource or the services um, that are needed are being provided, but there are still some nuances that need to be worked out, especially around areas of legal and following up on some uh, happen a weekend happenings and those types of things. Next slide. And now we're up to our spotlight on excellence. We're so excited that the Heath Model UN team is here uh, with us. Um, joining us tonight is Heath Principal Dr. Asa uh, Sevilius, as well as the Heath School Social Studies teacher uh, Elsie Terry, who is also the Model UN uh, facilitator. Uh, this is Ms. Terry's third year in leading the student program. We also have four students tonight who are representing the larger Model UN team uh, of Heath in grades six through eight. We're pleased to celebrate the Heath uh, School Model UN team this evening for their dedication and achievements, which include some very impressive awards at the mo most recent Model UN conference. Dr. Sevilius and Ms. Terry will speak a bit more about the students' accomplishments, and we look forward to hearing from the students as well. And as our tradition and custom, we have um, the Heath School certificate, team certificate here, and we'll make sure we get it to you. So with that, we'll stop sharing our screen and turn it over to Dr. Sevilius. Oh, we're so excited to be here. Um, I see uh, the four students here in the room, and I'm really already super proud of them because I know they're going to do a great job tonight. Um, I don't want to say much, actually, this initiative to bring Model U in was really um, 
Elise Terry's, you know, baby. Elise is a newer teacher here in the district and has really been a fantastic addition to Heath and, and the district and the lives of these kids. And um, I'm really proud of the work she's done to really craft this program that's really, really engaging and really, um, I think a lot of kids come and it's, and it's, and, and it's a opportunity that's not just for the snacks, right? We have good snacks, but it's not just for the snacks. Kids are really, really practicing and refining a lot of incredible skills. And you're gonna see it on display tonight. And so Elise, I give it over to you. Thank you, Asa. I am Elise Terry, and I have been very excited to restart a Model UN club at the Heath School. It was a huge part of my life as a student, and it feels wonderful to be on the other side of it now. Um, if you know anything about Model UN or similar debate teams, you know that the students who are usually drawn to it are excellent speakers and really excel at speaking for themselves. Um, so my four student representatives here tonight are Aditi and Daphne, who are some of our senior team members, and then Ryan and Zachary, who are new to the team this year and are already making a big impression. So to get things started, I would like to hand it off to Aditi to talk a little bit about your experience in our club. So I decided to join Model UN because I'd never heard about it. So I went to one meeting just to see what it was about and I was really amazed because I had so much fun. And what I enjoy about our weekly meetings is that there's really no pressure at all. We make mistakes and we learn together, but unlike in a conference, it's with people we know. So it lets us practice without fear of messing up. On the other hand, the thing I enjoy about formal competitions is that you're fully immersed in the debate. It's cool to think about how much we can accomplish because even though our roles as delegates are pretend, the problems and solutions are very real. Model UN helps you hone your debate skills. I know I've greatly improved in that area through our weekly meetings and conferences. That became especially apparent to me when I won an award at my last conference. It was a proud moment to hear my country announced to the large assembly and to know that it was because of the work I put in. The Heath Model UN team has conquered in the three years since its creation. We brought home many awards, and with each one, we get recognized as a bigger deal in the Model UN world. Proof of that is that we will be representing Russia, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, in the upcoming Misvan conference. Heath is on the map, and that is because of our, comp our competitive spirit. We are so driven and hardworking, and give these conferences our all. Thanks, Aditi. Ryan, you're up. Well, good evening. The reason I joined Molly Wen was because I really love debate. And when I heard Molly Wen was a debate club, I wanted to try to go to one meeting and see if I really liked it and wanted to go to more. And of course, I went to more. And it's been a very good life decision because I, it, I look forward to it every week. And I have learned a lot from it. It's is a very energetic environment, but it's also a learning environment. And it's very fun to learn about things. And Ms. Terry makes it very easy for me to understand the Molly Wen, which I used to feel was very complicated and it still is, but it's a lot less complicated. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Let's go now to Daphne. Uh, hi, my name is Daphne. I'm in eighth grade and I decided to join the Model UN Club because it seemed interesting and like a good opportunity to be part of a community. And when I went to the first meeting, I knew I was right. I really enjoy our weekly meetings because we always have fun and sometimes play games that help us to build our skills. Personally, I really enjoy that you really know, uh, really never know what you could learn at each meeting, but you do know that you can always learn more, whether it's about the UN or a good stra strategy for debating. I also really enjoy formal competitions where we get to exercise our debate skills even more and attempt to solve a problem for the perspective of a country that you are assigned, which forces you to think a different way, work together, and compromise with other countries for a common goal. I'm proud of receiving a few awards during the three years I have been in this club, club as well as shifting to the online environment during the past couple years because of COVID, which I think the Heath Model UN Club has done a great job of so that we can still have our meetings and conferences. I think that Model UN helps me to get a better at problem solving with the different issues that we deal with, 
especially in formal conferences or simulations during weekly meetings. It also helps us with public speaking and debating when both playing debate games and when speaking in front of other delegates. And lastly, we develop teamwork and compromising skills when delegates work together in competitions. I think what makes Heath's Model UN team excellent is that we are a great community that works together, has fun, and we all try hard, but still don't put competition before all else. So the fact that it is a perfect mix of both really is a strong part of our group. Thank you. Thanks, Daphne. And finally, we will go to Zachary. Hi, my name is Zachary Givens, and I'm a sixth grader at Heath School. I decided to join the Model UN team because I really like debate. And I like debating even more that I have joined the team. We have fun weekly practices with Miss Terry and we work in small groups with different team members so, um, each time. And that has helped me to sharpen my debate skills and public speaking skills too. Thank you for spotlighting your Heath Mario and team. Thanks, Zachary. And thank you to all four of you for sharing what has been special to you about this club. Um, we are certainly very proud that we've been able to persevere through some unusual years and create a space for a lot of Heath Middle Schoolers to thrive. Um, we have four right here who are ready and willing to join the school committee meetings, um, which is really exciting to me. So thank you, Dr. Guillory, for this chance to talk about our club. We're very proud of it. And with that, Suzanne, that concludes the uh, superintendent's report. Thank you so much, Dr. Guillory. Thank you so much to the HEAT students who have come to speak to us. It's not easy to do. There are many adults who do not want to speak in front of the school committee. So it's a, it really is a, a point of pride and accomplishment to come and speak so well. And thank you so much for that you're doing. I know that and for Dr. Sevelius for your support for this. Um, any, any quick comments or questions anybody has? I'll jump in and say that the PTO has also been a really very helpful sponsor, you know, through this. I think that acknowledging how, even though this is really a student space, a student-centered space, and, and Elise is creating those conditions where students can really thrive together, like the support system around it really is parents who are getting their kids dressed and ready to go and to perform in a debate, providing the snacks, providing money to support the program through our PTO. And so I want to make sure we can see kind of the invisible support systems around the kids too. There's always a village behind whatever is happening. <laughs> I'm so glad the Heath village is so supportive. Um, anyone else? Otherwise we'll, yeah. Helen? I just have to remark on how wonderful it is what you're doing, Miss Terry, and the kids. Um, it's so impressive, impressive that you've come to share it with us and um, what you're learning from it. Um, it really will serve you very well in life, which is probably what's the most important thing about school, to have things that will help you when you get older. Um, and hopefully you'll join the high school model UN. So, and how many, just a quick question, how many kids are involved in the Model UN? Uh, it depends on the, the week and the year, um, but this year we tend to have between 20 and 30 students um, at, at our largest meetings. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Yes. Yeah, Claire? Um, well, I just want to say this warmed my heart so much. All of you are so awesome. And it just makes me so happy to hear that Heath has such a great Model UN team. I did Model UN in middle school and it was like one of my favorite things. I wanted to say to any rising ninth graders for next year, you should totally run for legislature if you're interested in speaking and policy and maybe one day you can be school committee student representative. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Claire. I saw you cheering them on. That was great. So thank you very much to everybody from Heath. You're welcome to stay as long as you want, but of course you're welcome to go on and carry on with your evening. So thank you so much. Thank you all again. This is awesome. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to begin. Oh, sorry. Um, the superintendent's report. Do we take questions on that? Yeah, you can. Yep. Okay. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Guillory, for giving us the update on the SRO program. I think it's 
helpful to kind of see how the thinking is starting to evolve. Um, I'm sort of curious what to tell people when they ask about sort of when we'll have more of an answer on things like, you know, an MOU or a policy position or, um, you know, this, the S <clears throat> that we got an SRO um, fact sheet last year, which detailed dozens and dozens of things that SROs do. Um, and so I think it'd just be helpful for us to understand from a, you know, just from a policy perspective, but then also just from a public communication perspective, kind of what we're, what we're, what we're saying as a district. And obviously I, I definitely hear what you're saying, which is people need a little bit of time to work with this, but I think it's important to give people a little bit of a timeline as to when we'll, when we'll get back to them. I mean, the specific question that I've gotten is, you know, the police department has, has four FTEs assigned to the schools, what are they doing? Um, and if they're not doing school things, then we should say so. And if they are, we should say so. Um, it's not really, you know, police department staffing is not really our bailiwick, nor is the police department budget. But to the extent that funds are being spent by the town for the school's benefit or this on the school's behalf, um, I think we just need to be able to explain that piece of it. So I'm not saying it should be higher, or lower, or whatever, but I do think we need to be able to say, here's what the SROs are doing from a policy perspective and from an operational perspective, here's why they're doing it. And here's how many people we think we need um, and kind of how we're gonna do that in terms of an, an MOU. So anyway, I, I assume most of this is on the radar screen, but um, I just wanna be able to give people an answer back on some of those things. So, very, very um, appropriate questions. And uh, I think what I'll do is reflect a little bit more with the team on those specifics and then provide it, um, a timeline an anticipated timeline at our next meeting. Okay. Yeah. Great, thank you. Any other questions, comments for Dr. Guillory on his report? I have one. Sure, Mariah. I just wanted to say how great I thought it was that you were visiting um, our schools that are also out of district schools. It's so great to see um, that inclusive perspective in, um, thinking that we're not just a system of 10 schools, but of 10 plus many more schools. And I was very grateful to that. So thank you. Okay, anyone else? Uh, what time are we? Are we on the right time? Yeah, we're doing well. So um, we are going to move to public comment and we do have uh, a few speakers tonight. So our first one is Abby Erdman. And after Abby is So Young Kim. Abby, go ahead. Uh, to, dear, dear Dr. Gilroy, let me see if I, do I get a picture or no? <laughs> Sometimes you don't. Okay, I'll just forge ahead. Okay, go ahead, thanks Abby. Uh, I'm, I'm reading a letter that was written by Bridge Brookline for Racial Justice and Equity and signed by 17 out of 18 of our leadership to uh, dear Dr. Gilroy, Head Anthony Meyer and members of the school committee. We're writing with anger and dismay about the ongoing cut to the ACE program's guidance position and the longstanding pattern of underperforming students of color because of the school's structural racism. We believe it's harmful and destructive for all students to attend a segregated school system. COVID cannot be an excuse. There are entrenched problems that Brookline Public Schools have failed to solve. We've met with three superintendents over three years. We've met with the past director of equity and are talking with the present senior director of educational equity. We've spoken at school committees. We've met with individual school committee members, but our voices have not been heard and the children and their parents continue to be neglected. Meetings are not a substitute for corrective action. Years ago, for example, we began alerting former superintendents in the school committee about the inevitable negative effect on students in ACE because half the guidance position was cut. We predicted this dire impact in many, many letters. We spoke out at school committees and directly in person with Anthony Meyer, all to no avail. The solution is obvious and inexpensive restore the ACE guidance position, half of one position to prevent the dramatic decline in college attendance. The percentage of ACE students who were accepted into four-year colleges in 2018 was 
but dropped to 57% in 2021, in the two years after the reduction of the guidance counselor position. The drop in the rate of college attendance was even more dramatic. In 2018, 93% attended four-year colleges, only 31% attended in 2021. The data has only gotten worse, and right now students are applying to college, A students, many of whom are also first-generation low-income, need the extra support provided by the guidance position. Eliminating the position has widened the opportunity gap for some of the district's most marginalized students and deprived the A students of the help they deserve. This is urgent. Brookline must take the necessary corrective action to make sure that students of color and low-income students have real educational opportunities. With respect and urgency, Bridge leadership, Bonnie Bastion, Deborah Brown, Malcolm Cawthorn, Abby Erdman, Raul Fernandez, Paul Harris, So Young Kim, Julia Lanham, Natalia Linos, Bob Miller, Abigail Ortiz, Kimberly Richardson, Luciana Shashnik, Juan Wega Shaw, Kristen Singleton, Amy Takanami, Ginny Vasquez. Thank you, and I um, really urge you to take action on this. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Abby. So Young, you're next, and then Elena Spanjard. Am I on? Yes, you are, go right ahead. Okay, great, thank you. Good evening, Superintendent Guillory and members of the school committee. Um, I'm sort of going to add on to what um, Abby Erdman has uh, read of our letter. Uh, so my name is So Young Kim, and I'm here tonight to remind you of a cause that was brought before you three years ago and that still remains unresolved today, the reduction of Kara Lopez's role as guidance counselor in the ACE program at BHS. The situation for the students of ACE is dire. The data show this. If Kara's position is not reinstated, the students of ACE will continue to suffer. My daughter Skye graduated from ACE this past year. For her senior year legacy project, she made a documentary about ACE and about the impact Kara's role reduction has had on the students. I shared this documentary with all of you over the summer in one of my emails. I saw Skye this past weekend. She's currently a freshman at NYU studying computer science. She shared with me how ACE prepared her to navigate her challenging engineering classes. As an Asian American kid bearing up under the model minority myth, Skye hasn't always been this confident. As her mother and as a woman of color myself, I'm so grateful to see my daughter thriving because of the skills ACE has taught her. I share this with you because this is precisely what ACE does so well. Amy Beyer and her team of teachers help each A student to grow and equip them with skills that they so badly need to navigate a world that isn't always on their side. Many students of color, many students on the margins need a program like ACE to support them as they try to figure out their place in this world. When we talk about equity and inclusion, do we want our students of color to be able to go on from Brookline Public Schools knowing that they were supported and cared for? We have an opportunity here to right some of the wrongs of the past. We have an opportunity in ACE to invest in our marginalized students. We have an opportunity to do the work of inclusion and equity. Please, I ask you as a parent to do your part to reinstate Kara Lopez to full-time guidance counselor at ACE. The students of ACE need her. Thank you so much. Thank you, So Young. Uh, Elena, you are up, and then Yalisa Burgo. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go right ahead. Thank you. My name is Elena Spaniard. I reside at 282 Tapping Street, and I am a DHS parent. I have a child who is a senior in the ACE program this year, and tonight I am speaking in support of ACE and requesting that Kara Lopez's guidance position is reinstated to full-time for the ACE program. I agree with the comments made from Brookline for racial justice and equity, and I would like to share the positive impact that ACE and Kara have had for my child. She struggled to perform to her potential in mainstream school despite consistent support from teachers and guidance. Since joining East last year as a junior, her academic achievement has greatly improved and now reflects her abilities. 
More importantly, she has regained her confidence as a student and has a more positive vision for her postgraduate planning. The confidence and life skills that my child gained from ACE and care support will extend far beyond her time at BHS. Kira's work supporting students in postgraduate planning is really critical for their confidence and their independence. ACE's approach to building competencies through learning and practicing new skills requires consistent support, but it adapts over time as their independence grows. Reducing Kira's position has had a direct and measurable negative impact to ACE students, particularly for students of color and low income. Thank you for your attention, and please don't hesitate to follow up with any questions or requests for additional information from me if needed. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Uh, yeah, Lisa, Lisa, you are up, and then Susan Gordon. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go right ahead. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jalisa Burgos. I am a BHS senior of the ACE program. I wanted to come and publicly comment and I agree with definitely what Elena, Abby, and, um, and Ms. Kim have said of reinstating Kara's position. It has definitely made an impact on us seniors in ACE and for me, for example, I, you know, I am a, a student of color and fall into the bracket of low income family. And it has been very difficult with the college process as Kara's position has been cut in half. What I have known is that when she was in full time, she has been very active with even the juniors and the seniors preparing for this, this very big step in our high school career and our life. And I would, I really would, it would be a very, an amazing thing that we would have Kara as our full-time counselor, because it would make a big impact on us. And if we have her for the next generation of seniors and going on to college, it would just grow that percentage that has dropped so, so far down. And, um, um, yeah, thank you so much, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Yalisa. Uh, Susan, you are up. On mute. There, now you can hear me. Now I can, go right ahead. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I am the parent of two former A students. One is my natural born child, and I am the adoptive parent of a student who found herself homeless while she was at Boston, while she was in Brookline High. And she has been part of our family for the last four plus years. And I want to, would like to share tonight um, a letter that they shared with you when we were going around this same issue three years ago as far as retaining Kara as a full-time guidance counselor in the ACE program. This was a letter that they sent to Superintendent Bott as well as school committee members and other administrators within the high school and town hall. Dear Superintendent Bott, we are two of the many students in the ACE program at BHS and we will graduate in just a few more days. We both came to the ACE program in the fall of 2017. And with that move, we finally found a place where we belonged at BHS. Our stories that led us to the ACE program are very different, but some things we shared in common. In our personal lives, we both have struggled. We both had to work through many adversities, just like many of our classmates. We also deal with anxiety. Some of the struggles and adversities in our lives have changed and we are trying to work on the anxiety part. Neither of us could find a place to be successful in the mainstream at BHS. During our two years in ACE, we found a place that really works for each of us. 
both of us are heading to very competitive four year colleges right here in Boston, just down the road on Huntington Avenue. These colleges were definitely way beyond what we thought would be even reach schools for each of us. They would never even have been on our college lists if it weren't for the six adults in the ACE program who believed in us and asked us to believe in ourselves. Our counselor, Cara Lopez, has always been available to support us, even if sometimes it was late at night. Her help with the confusing college application process was amazing because it was trying, because just trying to fill out a FAFSA application is enough to make you want to quit. Kara is always ready to help with any of the problems that any kids in ACE are having. She does that part of her job incredibly well. She does that part of her job really, really well and is very busy doing that every day. Sometimes she's even doing it on the weekends. Please don't split the counseling job that she's doing for us in half. If she has to give half of her time to us and to mainstream kids as well, it feels like ACE will be the losers and the mainstream kids will be the winners. They'll get a lot because Kara is really good at her job. We will only get half of what we need and that really doesn't seem like it will work very well for the kids in ACE. We don't know if all the people making the decisions about next year's counseling changes, so we decided to send this letter via email to lots of people. Thank you all for taking the time to read about our concerns, and we hope that you will hear back from us soon. Sincerely, Ian Gordon and Bruna Roca. Um, I find it incredibly sad that we're in the same place three years later. And I hope you will consider bringing Kara back to the ACE program. And as Raul Fernandez said a number of years ago at a meeting that I was attending, it's hard to understand why you're taking from the have nots and giving to the haves. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, you are our last speaker. So um, thank you for that input from everybody. Suzanne? Uh-huh. Before, before we continue, I'd just like to add that um, in June, So Young Kim, one of the speakers tonight, I think did a really excellent job putting together data about um, college pursuit rates among ACE participants and completers. And they were quite high. And I understand that there's a lot of competition for resources right now, and we have to consider FTEs against the desire for FTEs elsewhere. But in light of last session's MCAS presentation and the disparities presented there, I think it is worth emphasizing that we've heard tonight, not just from parents, but from participants in a program that was really meaningful for students of color, and that parents have already done a pretty good job, I think, amassing data presenting um, what an impactful program this has been. So I would just like to add my voice to that. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, we are now going to move on to uh, some of our committee, school committee actions that we have for tonight. Um, the first one is uh, about the final settlement for the Cypress Street Realty Trust in town of Brookline. Um, Jonathan, are you here? Jonathan Simpson, did I see? I'm here. Yeah, there yeah. you are. Thank you. Did you want to just give us a little background on this? Do we? And we need to vote, I believe. Yes, I'm happy to. I will be brief. I know you have a, a long agenda. Um, as you know, uh, the property on which the uh, high school annex uh, is being built was uh, taken by the town via eminent domain at, at the beginning of 2018. Uh, at the time, we paid the former owner of the property uh, $15.9 million uh, as uh, an award for damages for the taking of his property. Uh, subsequent to that, however, he brought uh, a suit claiming that the damages paid were insufficient. This was expected. It's, it's customary in, in, uh, in eminent domain takings. Uh, we had been in litigation with him since then. Uh, but several months ago, we entered into mediation, and I'm happy to report that we, um, we were able to reach a settlement of all 
uh, claims as to the damages being paid uh, of 20, uh, a total of $20 million. So that would be an ad additional $4.1 million. This, the select board uh, took, uh, considered the matter first in executive session and then ultimately and voted in open session to approve the settlement. And um, so we are now, uh, because we intend to get pay that settlement out of the high school budget, we do need votes from uh, the, this committee as well as the building commission, which we attained, obtained last night. So um, with this, uh, with this, um, once this the the settlement is is paid and the case is dismissed, uh, there uh, it will there he will have waived all further claims on the property and uh, will be good to go. So I'm here to uh, just request a request a quick vote on that, please. And Jonathan, it's my understanding that the money is there already in in the high school budget. Correct? Yes, yesterday at the uh, building commission meeting, um, the question was asked if this. Um, uh, would come out of the contingency uh, that is reserved in the project. It will, and moreover, it will not entirely drain that contingency. They have a, a budget item that is uh, more than sufficient to cover uh, the settlement. Thank you very much. Uh, do I have a motion to uh, move this, Susan? I'll move it. And just, I wanna say thank you, Jonathan. This was such a long haul. Thank you to you and the entire team um, of people internal and external that were working on this. Um, there are a lot of ways this could have turned out, and although it's you know more money, um, it's uh, it's it's a it's a good outcome. So thank you very very much for all the work you did. Thank you to Ray as well, who's been sort of swinging at this um, along the way as well. And Ray, I see we see you, so thank you <laughs> as well. Uh, do I have a second? Thank you, David. Uh, any other comments or questions before we take a vote? Okay, not seeing any. I'll take the vote. David? Yes. Val? Jane. Uh, Susan? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Helen? Yes. Andy? Yes. Stephen? Yes. Mariah? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So thank you. Thank you to Jonathan and Ray. Um, thank you very much, everyone. You're welcome to stay as long as you want, but you're also welcome to go on about your evening. <laughs> I think I'll take advantage of that generous offer. Thank you. There you Look go. at the rest of it, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, David, we're moving to you on the uh, second reading of the Brookline School Emissions Policy. Yes, so just to remind the full committee, at our last full committee meeting, we discussed this policy. There was one open question at that time, which was around the language on the first page under the residency section. Uh, the last sentence, which reads, it is presumed that if a student is residing here for three months or less, the student does not meet resident eligibility requirements. I had written to town council inquiring as to what our obligations are with respect to how long a student can remain uh, non, not registered for school while living in uh, a municipality within Massachusetts. I received a response to that, which is included in the file that all of you uh, should have access to today. And essentially the conclusion from that was that there is no minimum or maximum period. Residency needs to be established. The school committee determines what will constitute residency. Uh, so then the secondary question to that was whether from a policy standpoint, we are okay with keeping the current language at three months or less. The subcommittee voted three to one to amend the three months to four weeks and to also add language during the school year so that it's clear that the four week timetable would be uh, for uh, the amount of time that a student is spending in Brookline during the school year. So we would not be including the summer months. And the reason for that is because uh, that would avoid the potential of a child living in Brookline for June and July uh, and or July and August rather, and then maybe being in school for a couple of weeks in September or the reverse, a couple of weeks in June. Uh, so that's why that clarification was sought. Uh, there was also discussion about whether we should table any change on the three month language because that question is really tangential to the broader goal for getting this policy through, which was to streamline and make it easier for the Office of Enrollment and Registration 
to uh, engage in their work for preparing for next year. And there was really no controversy at the subcommittee level or on full committee with respect to anything else that was in the draft. There were some minor changes made to uh, heading titles, for instance, and renumberings. Uh, also, we created a separate appeal section just to make clear that students and their families would have the opportunity to appeal adverse decisions. Uh, so I don't think that there's any dispute on those points, uh, but it remains an open question, even at the subcommittee level, because of that split this three one decision as to whether we should modify the three months to four weeks. Uh, so I'd like to hear from other committee members what your thoughts are. Yeah, Susan. Um, just uh, two questions. One is, was three months a problem? Like, is this a problem we're trying to solve? And if so, what was the problem? Um, and my second question is, I, it seemed to remember it took like several weeks just to enroll the kids in the first place. Um, so I would want to make sure that it doesn't take whatever, three weeks to enroll the kid, and then they're only here for four weeks or something. I just, it feels like a lot of, um, yeah, I just, I, what problem are we trying to solve with the three month thing? Megan, would you like to address that? Sure. Um, my understanding is when this policy was added, which is, um, uh, I'd like to state, was before my time, so I don't uh, have the institutional memory on the specifics of the conversations at that time. Uh, but I believe it was in order to address families who were feeling incentivized to do, um, make the choice to bring their children with them for short-term stays. Uh, here in Brookline, where they may be doing a six week um, stay at, at one of our universities or hospitals, for instance, that being one specific example of many, many uh, permutations that we could be working with, um, where, uh, you know, the, the disruption to the students and the families, they were not truly establishing their residency, but we're still uh, seeking to have the benefit of the public schools of Brookline. Uh, and, and as visitors. Uh, can I just, can I just um, interrupt? I'm really sorry to interrupt, but I guess I was asking a different question, which is why going from, was three months a problem? Uh, Meaning the only was, clarification I, yeah. so when uh, I requested clarification on the academic year component of that, it's that summertime, uh, does that count or not? Uh, that was the, the initial impetus for asking for clarification, not the have... length of time. Okay, but we don't have like families for whom the three month thing was a problem and that's the problem we're trying to solve with the one month thing. So the issue Susan about switching to one month was more around whether as a reflection of our values, we are comfortable with the potential of students being out of school for three months when they want to be enrolled based on this policy regarding how we are going to interpret residency. So under this policy, we are saying that if the plan is for a family to reside within town for three months or less, we are not going to consider those students to be residents and therefore we will not register them for school. And several subcommittee members had concerns that three months is a fairly long period of time to not have a child in school, especially when the family wants that child to be in school. And so as a compromise, uh, three out of four of us felt that a one month period would be, uh, would better serve the needs of students. Looking at the perspective of making sure that children who are in our community are receiving an education, even if it's for a very limited time. Okay, so just the other part is how long does it take to register a student? Like what are, just what's involved in this? So the first thing that a family must do is establish there and be able to present documentation regarding their residency. Some families are able to do that uh, expeditiously and others it takes a little bit more work um, on their end to do that. Um, and then as uh, every family has several opportunities to work with our providers that are gonna be working with their children to provide the appropriate support. So some students will meet with our English language education teachers. Uh, so that provides them uh, with an answer as to whether they'll be receiving those services uh, and how much. Uh, which does, again, add a bit of time uh, to work with our, our um, intake coordinator. 
Um, and every student will meet with a guidance counselor at their school to have a transition meeting to learn more about themselves, to get appropriate placements, um, learn about our school system uh, and be set up for success. Other students may meet with other folks. Um, high schoolers might need to do some placement testing for course placements. Um, some may need to meet with some of our special educators if they're coming in with special education um, documents to have a, uh, appropriate placements. Um, so it can vary how long this can take for a student based on their specific needs. Um, we do it as, as expeditiously as we can, of course, uh, but sometimes the delay is on our end because we have people who can't meet at the end of this first day, they have to wait another day. And sometimes it's on the family's end trying to prepare the appropriate documentation and so forth. Uh, Mariah and then Helen. Um, Thanks. I just have one question. I mean, to, to me, the, the case of um, children who would be perhaps in the, for whom it would make a difference are children who are um, perhaps in transitional housing um, or something like that. And my question is, are those children covered anyways by the, is it the McKinley-Vento Act that's referred to here anyway? Okay, so then can I get some clarity on, I'm trying to understand, and I guess maybe this is just restating Susan's point again, because I don't quite understand it. What is, what is the meaningful difference? What is a case in which we would want, why do we need to make this clarification? That's what I'm still puzzled by. Like what are the, or is it just that there's possibility of a child who is visiting for two months and we think that a child who's visiting for two months should be in school? That's my one question. The other thing is, I just noticed in the new text on um, on page two, the use of the word headmaster, and I think we've removed that from other language and just using principles these days. So maybe that it says headmaster or principal, and maybe it's just the principals. But anyway, just to get some clarity again on what is a case that we expect children to be here for two months. David, did you want to respond one more time to that or not? All right, well, so the concern is that sometimes our families who come, they're not intending to stay beyond a three month period, but their children are here for three months and we're not letting them register for school currently. Usually this comes up in the context of an ac of a academic internship of some kind at the graduate level, for instance, or temporary employment. And uh, three out of four subcommittee members felt that three months is a long period of time for a student to not be in school, especially if that, if that family wants to enroll the child and that families in those situations will be slipping through the cracks. It also could invite uh, some legal complications for that family with the Department of Children and Families, because when you are not send, enrolling your children in school, uh, they will get involved and the children could potentially end up in foster care. And if we have as a policy, a essentially a blockade on enrolling students in that situation, then we're exacerbating that challenge. Can I ask now, a follow-up to that a little bit? Okay, so now I understand that better. I didn't totally process it though, the first time. So why would it matter if they're here during the summer or not? Because if the summer months count toward the tabulation, whatever that period ends up being, then there could be a situation where we're enrolling a student for one week. Because if July and August count toward the three months and a family says we're going to be here July through September, are we really going to enroll a student for just September or what might be just a week in September, depending on the precise arrival time? Uh, and apparently that does sometimes occur. But aren't we, are, given that we do an extended school year program, wouldn't we be possibly disadvantaging students who need full year student support? I mean, if we're thinking about making sure students who need education are accessing it, isn't there a chance that the students who most need it are not able to access it? That's maybe a question more for staff.
the staff have an answer, someone on the staff have an answer about how we would handle uh, a situation where students need access to services during the summer? Well, I think the, I think the similar uh, piece that uh, Megan talked about in terms of assessing if someone's moving in for that period of time, you still have to go through that assessment period. And so the, the, summer, the summer piece in theory would be over, you know, in the case of a, a student coming with an IEP, verifying all of those aspects, I'm assuming. Um, but by the time they get in, the program would be essentially wrapping up if they're on the long end of that registration process side. And I would say uh, the, the way that the policy language is uh, written, it does have that presumed uh, as a sort of um, catch, if you will. So if a family were to present to my office, for instance, uh, transferring from an, another US or, or Massachusetts district with an IEP that was valid, we would assess that, we would address it with our special education team uh, to see what the services that they would be um, entitled to. Um, and, and it would be addressed uh, to ensure that whatever they are legally entitled to, that they would receive. Um, we would take it on a case by case uh, basis uh, in, in a situation like that. Helen, you wanna speak? Yes, I would like to. Uh, thank you for calling on me. Um, I actually do remember when this policy went into effect and the reason that it went into effect at the time. Uh, we had been experiencing large numbers of um, families that would come for a month or two on a visitor visa uh, and want their kids to be enrolled during the week because you know, if they were taking a course at Harvard or something like that. And the amount of time and effort for both the staff and the teachers and class that the kid goes into is huge for the one, two, four weeks that they might be with us or five weeks, whatever that might be. Um, at, we felt at three months, that was a substantial time that you could make an investment in, in a child. But to, for you know, most of these kids may be coming during their school break. So they're not like they haven't been in school. You know, South America is an opposite of us. So, you know, in the winter, they may be coming up here for during their summer break. The same thing with, I think uh, uh, the Asian countries, they, their, their schedule is different also. So I think we have to be careful here um, on the one hand, I hear what people are saying about kids, you know, being in school, and we do believe that. But on the other hand, we also have to understand what is actually happening here. And to me, three months and somebody who's here, like on a, a student visa or something like that, that makes sense. Those are children we want to make sure that we see in the Brookline schools. But less than three months, um, the amount of time that it takes just to orient uh, the, the child is here and gone and, and has taken an, a lot of time um, from staff. So uh, I, I certainly feel we should leave it at three months. I think this was something that was debated and, and talked about it, you know, same similar discussions that we're having tonight. Uh, David, are you are you ready and willing to move this forward, or do you want to? Well, I, I'd like. <clears throat> I am sensitive to the need to try to get some version of this policy, since we agree on ninety nine percent of it. It seems through, so that the Office of uh, Enrollment and Registration can move on in preparation for next year. I think we can handle this one of two ways. We could have a couple of votes. We could have one vote that amends the three month line to four weeks and see how it goes. Uh, and if that fails, we could then have another vote preserving the three months language. Uh, and at least that way we have something through. Because it seems like we agree on the vast majority of this draft and the main purpose for why Megan brought this to our attention. So I'll go ahead. Can I like some, just one more question on what you just said, David. Like, do we have evidence that there are I'm sort of trying to figure out if this is a solution in search of a problem or if there's, if there's a problem. Like, do we have evidence that there's some number of families who are here for less than three months 
who are in the situation that we're talking about over the last number of years, Megan, like either they're coming to us and they're, they're saying they want to enroll, but they're only here for a month and we're telling them no, like, is this a, is this happening to a lot of people? And, and if so, I would want to make sure we understood that. But I, I want to make sure we understood that. Yeah, you, um, you had the same thought as Val uh, yesterday at, at subcommittee. Uh, and the, the unfortunate answer to this is that we do not have data on this information. It's not something that we would ever have had the capacity to collect because it's very anecdotal. Um, you know, the last two years are terrible examples because, you know, everybody was upside down uh, anyway. Um, so nothing is, you know, normal there. Um, the policy has been in place for, goodness, five, six, seven years with this three-month language in it. Uh, so it is part of our, you know, um, language to families uh, as they're preparing to register. So we don't know to what degree that it has acted as a preventative deterrent for them to even ask. Um, but it may, in some cases, they may have gone and went, oh, that doesn't count for us. Never mind. You know, we'll come up with something else or not come or, you know, keep the kids at home and just one parent will come or, you know, all those kinds of uh, potential outcomes. So I don't have any data that I could reliably provide to the committee to consider in this case. Um, I don't think it's a huge number of families, although, um, as Helen was saying, there was sort of a movement of uh, folks who were seeking to enroll their kids. And that's why this policy was put in place in the first place. Right, and just to follow up on that, I mean, but what I'm not hearing is there's some flood of phone calls and we're turning away families and this is a big problem. I guess that's what I'm also not hearing, even though we don't have data. Um, can I ask just one other question? I, I seem to remember, around the time Helen was talking about that teachers were saying it was a tremendous amount of work to get a kid ready to get into the class and to introduce the, especially at the younger grades, to introduce the class, the child to the class and move around seating and pair them with people. And then it was a big deal like to say goodbye to friends. And I don't know, I just felt like, that, I felt like there was more here the last time we talked about this in terms of like disruption to the teacher and everyone else in the class also. So, I, but I might be misremembering that. Uh, I think you're correct. Okay, David, why don't you, uh, Jennifer, did you want to speak? Yes, I, I'm going to weigh in on the other side, which is my concern is that if a child is here for three months of the school year or two months of the school year, because their parents brought them here, then they're going to, they're, they're not going to get education for th that period of time. And my concern is, making sure that we provide education, public education to students who are in front of us. So that, that's my concern. I hear the other concerns and I know that it is time consuming, but my, my primary goal is to think about what is happening to those kids. They're not in charge of that decision. So how can we best meet their needs? So, so I guess I'm weighing in on the other side, knowing that it's complicated and it's time consuming and there's paperwork, but. I just can't in good conscience turn those kids away from an education. Well, I, I guess I don't want to argue with you, but I'd like to sort of put a, point out the other side of it, that these kids may not be lacking in education. They may be on their summer vacation, you know? And so, you know, it, it, we have to sort of balance here what, you know, what is right. Um, you know, in some respects, some of the parents are looking for babysitting, you know, so they can go and do what they want to need to do. And that's, that's not what we're about. Um, I don't know, I, I, I feel actually pretty strongly about this, that three months is a reasonable time, especially if somebody's here on a visitor's visa um, and, you know, not planning on staying. Uh, it just, you know, I, you know, maybe one of the things, David, you might want to do is see what other districts do, Cambridge and uh, some of the other districts to see, if, you know, what their policies are, or do we know that? I don't have an answer to that. Does anyone from the staff know how other districts handle this? So David, do you want to move forward? Do you want to make a motion and vote? Oh, I'm forward. So I'm going to move that we approve the motion, uh, the, pol the this policy draft as amended by the subcommittee yesterday. 
the uh, main sentence that's being changed, it will now read, it is presumed that if a student is residing here for four weeks or less during the school year, the student does not meet resident eligibility requirements. The one other change I'll add to reflect what Mariah pointed out is to remove any mention of the word headmaster. Okay, do I have a second to that motion? Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, we will take a vote. Wait, can, can, can I amend the motion? Okay. So I'd like to amend the motion to go back to the original three months. Uh, okay. Uh, Helen, if I might just ask, would that be with the during the school year language added or without? But was that there before? It was not, but it was uh, requested by staff, I believe, to have the during the school year part added. Okay, yeah, with the, uh, then definitely respect that what the staff wanted, yes. Okay. Second okay. Helen's amendment if it needs a second. It would need a second, thank you, Andy. So I guess we vote first on Helen's amendment. Um, which I'm sorry, is, Suzanne. Yeah, could, Stephen. Would you mind repeating what we're voting on? Yeah, no, that's what I'm trying to work up to. So um, <laughs> uh, Helen was saying, you're saying we go back to the original uh, for three months. You have to be here three months. If you're here for three months or less, you are not considered a resident. Is that what we're voting on, David? Correct. Right, and during the school year. And then the one other question I'll ask, Helen, do you also want to throw in Mariah's point about removing the word headmaster? Into your oh, memory? sure, sure. Okay. Okay, so Stephen, are you, are you clear? I, I'm sorry, I'm still confused. So is this replacing David's proposal? Yeah, it's an amendment to his proposal. So it, it isn't, would... it, isn't it countervailing to David's proposal? Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. Yes, yeah, so this, is, a, this is now a proposal to go back to the draft that was circulated to us uh, in writing. Sorry, so it sounds to me that there are two different proposals, not one so proposal first... and an amendment. <laughs> So first we would be voting on Helen's amendment. So the question before us right now is whether we want to stick with the three months or less during the school year language. If that amendment fails, then we would be voting on um, my proposal, which was four weeks or less during the school year. Thank you, David. So if you vote yes, you're voting for three months. Right. Thank you. Sorry okay. to be dense. No, no. Thank you for being voted. Technically, you have to vote it twice either way. First, we vote for the three months, and then you have to, as an amendment, and then you still have to vote the main motion. So we have to. No, this is replacing the main motion because if you can't, it's you can't vote this. Huh? It's an amendment. It's not another main motion. You can't have two main motions. It's an amendment. All right. First, we vote on the amendment. I understand and that. Then we vote on the main motion. If the amendment passes, the amendment replaces the language of the main motion, and then we vote on it again. Oh, okay. We vote twice no matter we vote twice no matter what. No Whether matter it passes what. or fails, you vote twice. Are we ready? Okay. okay. So now we're voting on three months. Okay. Susan. Yes. Jennifer. No. Helen. Yes. Andy. Yes. Stephen. No. Mariah. No. David? No. Val? No. And I vote no as well. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Six no's to one, two, three yeses. So that failed. So now we go to the original one. Correct. The original that I proposed today, which is the four weeks or less during the school year. OK, let's, let's do, do that. So now we're voting yes if we want the four weeks. Correct? Correct. And to help everybody out. Okay. Uh, Val. Yes. Susan. No. Jennifer. Yes. Helen. No. Andy. No. Stephen. Yes. Mariah. Yes. David. Yes. And I vote yes as well. So it passes, four weeks passes six to three. To zero. Okay, thank you very much. Helen? Can I make a request 
that if it's possible for staff to keep track of this and see where we sure. how, how much of an issue this is and the and the time that it takes to do these um, uh, enrollments and and that both of the enrollment office and the, the classroom teacher. Can you do that, Megan? Is that possible? I can certainly uh, uh, do my best on, on the enrollment component. The teacher end um, will probably be a bit more anecdotal. Um, I'll see if I can get our school leaders to uh, help us keep track as, as these come, uh, occur. Uh, maybe it, you know, it won't be you know, exact figures, but the stuff that you have could at least. Thank sure. you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Megan. Um, Sam, you're up next on the MOA with the um, with AFSCME. Did you want to say a word or two before we vote? I think it's pretty similar to uh, the MOA sure. with units A and B, correct? Uh, yes, it is. And I want to thank Ty Fluker, who is in the room, uh, and, and, and Nick Dominello as well from uh, VDH. Uh, to uh, to get this done, and, and to thank AFSCME as well. Um, we we were able to uh, start with the BEU MOA as as a guiding document, and and you're right, Su uh, Suzanne. It, it's largely uh, largely similar uh, with respect to uh, expectation and. Um, uh, we reckon it was it was ratified by by uh, AFSCME and 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 we recommend uh, favorable action by by you all uh, as well. Thank you. I'll move uh, to accept the MOA to ratify it. Do I have a second? Thank you, Andy. Is there any uh, are there any questions or comments before we take a vote? Okay. Seeing none. We'll. Go ahead and vote. Susan. Yeah. Thanks. Jennifer. Yes. Helen. Yes. Andy. Yes. Stephen. Yes. Mariah. Yes. David. Yes. Val. Yes. And I vote yes as well. Thank you both to Ty and to Sam for making this happen. I'm sure that's great. Okay. We are going to move on to um, our, the first of our current issues. And I wanted to report out for a minute or two, a couple of minutes and get some input on our workshop that we had, uh, I believe it was last week, was it last? October 26th. I think you've had the minutes, so you hopefully you've had a chance to read that. Um, and we had a workshop with the school committee and uh, we had Dr. Uh, Blummer who uh, facilitated it and Dr. King was also there who helped with that. And we looked at our norms and roles that we adopted last January 21st, 2021. And uh, we said that actually the norms and roles actually make sense. They were pretty good. And for the most part, uh, we're pretty good at following them. There are a few that we need to tighten up our act and uh, make sure that we, uh, our actions follow what our words have said in norms and rules. So I'll give you some examples. Um, uh, so we do conduct a business through a set agenda. So that's one that we're, we're good about. Um, so in terms of when we get in question, important questions or concern that we receive from the community uh, to the superintendent, but it may come to us, the superintendent and not any school committee member has the authority to investigate. And so we wanna make sure that we follow that norm uh, and that it's uh, up to the superintendent to resolve the issue. It's not an issue uh, for the school committee member to resolve. So that was one area that we were talking about that we need to think about a little more. Um, we, in communication, uh, we agree uh, to contact each other well in advance of the meeting so that we can facilitate informed and reflective conversation. So make sure that uh, if you have issues, concerns, that they actually come 
uh, to dock it. So you can let the chair or the vice chair know what, you're, what you want to bring up so that uh, we will have uh, the right people here uh, at our meetings to help us with those conversations. And, um, they, and we also recommended that uh, committee members uh, channel requests for information reports and data through the superintendent. So instead of going to direct, directly to central office and saying, I need this or I need that, I need this data or that data, we actually do that through the superintendent and then he would help us figure out uh, how we can get the data and the information we need. So those are some areas that we talked about. Um, and to uh, and one of our goals this year is to uh, make sure that we have uh, improved communications with our community and our family members. Uh, Dr. Guillory is doing a great job, I think. Kudos to you for your newsletters on Fridays. They're very informative, so thank you very much for that. And uh, we also are going to try to do a better job as a school committee. And to that end, uh, we are kind of shifting gears a little bit. And uh, we had a thought, a conversation, uh, and, re and how to respond to emails. Uh, we get a lot of emails and the chair and the vice chair uh, discussed with Dr. Guillory during um, our docket session, our meetings, that uh, the chair would take emails from people whose names end in A to K and respond, and the vice chair would take L to Z. It doesn't mean that other committee members cannot respond, but that you'll know that at least one of us, the chair and the vice chair has responded to emails. If you know the person or if you know the topic and the issue and you want to respond uh, and speak for the school committee, you could do that, but you should let us know and then the chair and the vice chair will not respond. We'll let you do that instead. So that's a new idea we have. Uh, just kind of think about it for a minute, see how that feels. Um, subcommittee chairs can reach out to their assigned senior staff. We have, oh, okay, we want to hold up for a minute. Okay, before I go on, I see Mariah and then Andy. Mariah? I just wanted to say that um, I thought that um, Stephen and I had been tasked with the communication strategy and we were working on that. You are. So I'm hoping yeah. I, don't, I don't have a plan. I'm hoping that you have a plan coming up. Yeah. Well, we, yes, but including this email thing. And so, um, so okay. Maybe, so, I, yeah, maybe there's another opportunity to hear. So this is the, well, this, this could be a stopgap until you come up with a plan or until we approve the plan. How close are you? Hi, yeah. Hi, well, we, were, we met and we're, we're working on it. Um, when was that, Stephen? Um, over the weekend, right? Yeah, over the yeah. weekend. So, do so you, you think you're going to have it for the next meeting? Yeah, uh, I think we can. I think we could have a draft, yeah, for the next meeting. So, so we can we can wait uh, okay. until then. So we okay. don't, you know, it's just something that's important. So if you if that's yeah. part of the plan, that would be great. Okay. And we can just kind of do what we've been doing for for the next two weeks until you have a plan. Okay, thanks. Okay, okay yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we did say that if there's a really complicated email or an issue that, you know, we can bring that to the superintendent and have a conversation about how best to respond. Uh, sometimes there are those and it, it, it takes several heads to come together on that. So some other action items, uh, subcommittee chairs will- I think uh, Dr. Oh, Lou has a question. I'm sorry, who has a question? Dr. Liu. Um, oh, yeah. Hi, Dr. Liu. Go ahead, okay. Andy. Yeah, uh, actually, I was just uh, uh, hoping for uh, some clarification, Suzanne, on something you just said. Um, when you when you mentioned that anyone other than the chair and vice chair can also sort of choose to respond for the school committee, I think is what you said. But by respond for the school committee, I, I guess when I respond to emails, and I, I never think of it as responding for anybody except myself. Um, it, but I want to make sure that I'm not misunderstanding here. Like yeah. when we respond, we're responding as individuals and not speaking for the school committee. Is that well, right? You are responding as individual school committee members. Um, on the other hand, if the only one responding, that in a sense you're responding as a school committee response. Do you know what I'm saying? So let's let's wait and see what Mariah and Stephen have, and then let's have that conversation 
when okay, we yeah, get it'd be great if they could address, sort of, I guess, my Super question important. is to, to, to yeah. what extent, yeah. to what extent, an individual response from an individual member can be taken as a response from the entire committee. Yeah, yeah, that would be great, Mariah and Stephen, if you're addressing that, David, uh, absolutely. Uh, Okay. But just to that point about whether an email response is coming from the individual, from the whole committee, uh, I think that it's critically important that we are very clear in our responses who we are speaking for. The only time that uh, an individual should be speaking for the whole committee is when we have reached a formal agreement that that individual is going to be issuing a statement on behalf of the committee. So we sometimes do that in a negotiations context, for instance. Other than that, I think we should only be responding as individuals because we're not in a position to make a presumption or to speak for anyone else with whom we haven't had a prior authorization or where we don't really know what that other person might be thinking. If it's something that's purely factual, such as the school committee voted such and such on this date, right. that's speaking for the committee, but that's a fact that we're just retelling. So that's a bit different. Uh, but if it's an ongoing matter, I think we should only be speaking as individuals unless the entire committee has authorized uh, one person to speak for all of us. Okay, Stephen and then Susan. Um, I'll just say the, the problem that Mariah and I are looking to address really is, Mariah, correct me if you disagree, is really restricted to ensuring that community members who who send a, an email or otherwise communicate with the school committee do receive an answer. So uh, it's not our intention also, David, in the line with what you said to throttle any member for speaking for him or herself, but just to make, uh, just to provide petitioners or other community requests with, uh, with information that they might find useful and uh, to ensure that they do receive a response. Uh, I would add on to that. It's not that's not our exclusive goal. We were also hoping to sort of streamline the workload of the committee um, as well. But but certainly, I would then agree with Stephen and say, but anyone who wants our goal is not to to muzzle anybody who chooses to respond. Simply to make it so that we're ensuring people get a response while also not having committee members worry that if they don't respond, no one will respond. So to come up with a structure that achieves both of those goals. Yeah, great. Susan, did you want to comment? Most of what I said was just said by Stephen and Mariah, so I won't repeat it. I would only, add, but I agree. Um, I would also add that we do run into open meeting law issues if we're all CC'd on something and three or four of us start to reply all to an ongoing issue. And so it really is a good idea to have one person who's on point because that way, people know that they also feel like they don't have to respond as Mariah said, but also we don't get into a situation of multiple people responding when that isn't appropriate. So for example, if it was a proceed, if it's something in process, say the school committee has discussed that three times, we're gonna discuss it again. If you have thought, you know, we're happy to, we, we all read these emails or feel free to come to public comment, you know, that's different from trying to actually engage with somebody on something. So if you're responding on your own behalf, just your own opinion, and you see, see everyone, that becomes a problem. So I'm just, it's a little more complicated, that's all. It is complicated, right. Right, thank you. Uh, so we wait for Stephen and Mariah's guidance on that. See, and you know what? It's gonna be a work in, in progress and we're gonna to have to uh, you know, review and reflect on it as we do this to see what works and what doesn't work. My second kind of action step was, uh, again, I said subcommittee chairs reach out to their assigned uh, senior staff member. Uh, for instance, curriculum, Jennifer reaches out to uh, OTL. Uh, and so that, that how, is how it's going. And Dr. Guillory has offered to be the senior liaison to policy subcommittee because they did not have one. So thank you for that. Um, Chair and Vice Chair came up, uh, should review uh, implementation of the norms. Um, and uh, if you again have topics that you want to come up on the agenda, uh, you should send them to us or to Dr. Guillory and they will be discussed at DACA and placed on the agenda where it seems appropriate. Uh, the fourth one is the superintendent uh, will let the school committee members know if we are outside of our lanes. So sometimes we get involved in things that he would really like to take on and it's really central office or his issue and his need to respond, not ours. So he'll let us know that. 
um, we're going to, it was suggested we work towards establishing agendas for the full school year. And we do have a number of topics that we listed at workshop this summer. And we've actually been through probably a third of them already. So we'll review the, the ones that we've said we'd come back to and also the ones that we suggested we want to hear about and make sure we have those on the docket this year. And it was suggested that we review norms and roles uh, at our next workshop. And as I said, really, as we're going along and, and challenges come up and we then try to address those. Uh, so that was kind of a quick wrap up of our conversation that we had at workshop. Uh, a reminder, just kind of to the public and, and for our school committee members that uh, the chain of command is how letters should, uh, emails and letters should go so that if a parent or a family wants to address something uh, about their student, they should first go to the teacher. After the teacher, you go to the building administrator. After the building administrator, if you still have not gotten the uh, answers that you need, uh, it doesn't mean that they agree with what you think they should be, but that you just haven't gotten the answers, then you can go to central office or the superintendent. Um, the discussion a little bit at the workshop was that if we get involved in areas that are not what we are specifically uh, assigned to do, then we may be interfering with the work of central office. And uh, taking, distracting them away from their work, which is of course teaching and learning. And so we will do our very best to, uh, to make sure that, that we are supportive and not a distraction. Is that what we say, Dr. Guillory? Don't be a distraction, be a support. Um, and as Dr. Guillory says, keep the main thing the main thing, that we are all really focused on teaching and learning for our children and giving them the best educational experience that we can. Questions, comments, concerns about this? Dr. Guillory, did you want to jump in at all to put you on the spot? Uh, I will. Um, again, I just want to thank the committee for their participation in the workshop. I think it was uh, very productive. Um, and I think for the community listening uh, to this segment, uh, it was about, oh, there are my lights. Uh, it was about the, uh, the opportunity to uh, calibrate uh, as a new uh, superintendent uh, here in the public schools of Brookline uh, with the committee, uh, with the existing school committee. So um, this is um, what I've been doing, the work that we've been doing as a senior team is also in our calibration process as well. So we are a new team here and we're going through a similar process of defining how we work together, how uh, we can be as efficient as possible and um, that uh, every kid, every student by face and name to through and beyond graduation. Uh, as uh, Suzanne uh, just reiterated, keep the main thing, the main thing, which is an intense focus uh, on teaching and learning our students at the center. And so I think um, this is uh, uh, the first step of one of many of us becoming more efficient uh, in our working relationship. So I, again, I want to appreciate the committee for the time, attention and dedication uh, at the workshop. Other comments, concerns, questions? Okay, seeing none, we will carry on. We will look forward to uh, the plan for Mariah and Stephen, and I'm sure there'll be much conversation when that comes, comes to us. So thank you for that. We are now going to, uh, do we have, Mar uh, Megan, are we ready to go forward with the enrollment? I know Erin um, is gonna join us as soon as she can. Yep, she's she's on by phone, but I'm gonna drive this pony for the for the time being as it is. So I'm happy to get started with that for you guys. I'm just gonna share my screen. Can you guys see the presentation? Yes, I can. Thank you. All right. Very good. Uh, so this evening, I am uh, pleased to present to the committee and the community some more information about our current enrollment. Uh, this information is going to be based primarily around our October 1 um, enrollment numbers as submitted to the, the, the state. Um, 
So this evening, we're going to look at a few different pieces for your consideration. We're going to look at you know, our current numbers as they are uh, in, in broad strokes for October 1. And we're also going to look at that in the context of where we are um, in terms of uh, over other uh, across other years where we, we, we are trending. Um, and we're also going to look at how that compares with our end of year to beginning of year, sort of that transition across school years and times of the school year. I'm also going to spend a little bit of time analyzing uh, our withdrawal records that have been submitted so we can uh, be thinking about where our students are going when they're leaving us, um, including things like private school and homeschool enrollment over time. Uh, we'll discuss a few conclusions and then we'll be happy to address any questions as best we can that the committee might wish to pose. So the first piece here is our um, official submission number for October 1 for the uh, 2021 school year is 6,929 students. Of those, 4,842 4, are in our pre-K-8 uh, cohort. 501 is our kindergarten enrollment as of October 1. And Brookline High School has 2,087 students. Uh, and as we're looking at this trend line, you can see this is the last seven submission years. Um, we had an upward trend for several years. We sort of had a small minor dip uh, at seven, 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 <laughs> how many, seven, four sevens. Um, uh, and then the COVID year of 2020, 21, you can see that precipitous dip. Um, that began, uh, you know, became evident, I should say, in our enrollment numbers uh, as of September 2020. We are starting to see an increase. It's a, it's a small increase. We are up uh, 38 students uh, from October of 20. Our kindergarten increased 13 students from October of 20. And we've increased 52 students between October 1, November, uh, to November 1 of 21, just in the past month. Um, so at this point, I, we are still seeing students coming. Uh, the flow is still steady. Uh, it's, it may not be the flood that we saw at the very end of August and the very beginning of September, but it is still a steady flow of families who are arriving to our school community. Um, the current enrollment, that we have the 6,929 um, does keep our class sizes at 18 to 19 across the district. And we are seeing, as I've, I'm, uh, I understand the committee has heard from a variety of resources over the course of this uh, school year so far, the demands and needs of our students is a bit higher, uh, with social emotional supports, academic supports. Um, so, not too bad to have uh, well-sized classes. The other thing I, we wanted to show you is the differential between June uh, reporting to the October reporting. So that end of year, moving into the beginning of the next school year. So in 2019, we dropped down from our June to our October number. So we end the year higher than we do uh, at the beginning. In 2020, you can see that is where the COVID pandemic uh, withdrawals truly uh, had a precipitous drop, huge drop in numbers. Uh, and now we are seeing that uh, in 2021, our June number was 6829, and we've actually increased from the end of the year to the beginning of this year, uh, which is good news. This is a similar pattern that we are seeing in other districts from my colleagues and um, other communities nearby that we are sort of analogous to. Um, they are seeing these similar patterns in large and enrollment decreases. Um, and percentages are not as high as Brookline, but the overall churn numbers, um, which is especially evident in our English learner cohort, um, is much lower in other towns than it is in Brookline. Um, I have some examples here. So Newton in 2019, we're at 
12,779 and 20, it was 12,024. Cambridge went from 7,091 to 6,678. I made a couple other examples, but. Um, and um, one of the things that I did want to demonstrate for you guys is despite the fact that our overall number did not increase drastically, we are seeing demand. And that's evidenced in the slide here in this nice green headed column, new students enrolled. This is the number of students that my office worked with between the end of school year, uh, uh, June 29, 21, through September 30 before the reporting was completed. We enrolled 588 students. That's approximately an entire Baker school uh, worth of students for uh, that, that month period. But why our numbers didn't increase is simply because we are losing students at, at the other end, those, those students who are transiting to other places. So those who are transferring to other communities, we, there's not much we can do about that if families choose to move to Newton or Needham or you know, Springfield. Those families are making choices. They're moving out of our community. Those who are moving out of state or out of country, again, those families are making choices that are beyond sort of our control. The numbers that I think that are perhaps most uh, an opportunity for an area for us to investigate perhaps is those who are moving their students to private schools. So you can see we had uh, 149 of our students who withdrew transferred to private schools and 19 of them transferred to homeschool. Um, so those are all students who remain Brookline residents and are choosing not to be members of our school and learning community at this time. Um, those students who are marked 40, not enrolled, those are students who are receiving special education services. So they are still retaining uh, work with our service providers. However, they are attending private school as well. So that's another 19 students there. Um, we have had 85 uh, additional withdrawals and enrollments between June and uh, September. Uh, the, the, the net is 85. Um, for all that Baker School worth of enrollment, we only gained 85 students out of that. Um, and so to sort of dive into that a little bit more deeply, this is our uh, school attending numbers. These are students who are Brookline residents uh, who uh, are attending private schools here. Uh, and over time, we've always had many, many families who have chosen uh, private or independent schooling for their children. Um, you can see that that trend, you know, was increasing slightly. Uh, however, this year, there's a market increase. We went from the 1300s to the 1500s uh, worth of students. Uh, and in addition, uh, our homeschool population has changed quite drastically during this COVID period as well. Um, the good news on that front is that last January, we had 80 homeschool students and now we are down to 50. So some of those students have come back to us. So we are moving in the right direction, if you will, to welcoming those students to our community. And um, just to sort of go over some, some highlights here. So the total enrollment is higher than in October 20. So we are increasing, if slowly, um, we are increasing. We didn't lose kids, that's great. We are evenly distributed across our K-8 schools. So there's no particular deep pressure points in one neighborhood over another. So we're um, you know, spread out nicely. And we did register more than 500 students in the summer of 2021. It's an incredible, incredible number. Um, it's the most we've ever registered in a summer period. Um, the enrollment does remain pretty volatile. Um, students are still coming. You know, we have had those additional 52 kids in just uh, October 1 to November. And we are seeing international students coming in different waves 
based on international travel policy. So we know that um, just, just this week, there has been a change to international travel policies. So it'll be interesting to see whether that provides a, an additional bump. Um, I think there'll be a delay based on visa requirements for families who are looking to travel and settle. Um, but I do think we'll see some folks, but we did see stu many students from countries who were more permissive in their travel requirements over the summer. We were seeing those families returning to Brookline that we normally have. So that's um, something. Um, and the public schools has always had a high churn, which is to say, you know, the incoming and outgoing, this, this, this constant sh um, movement of uh, individual students, even though this 85 is the net, the individual students making moves is a much more volatile um, presentation than the numbers can ever project for you. Um, of course, just don't capture that human factor very well. Um, but our EL populations, for instance, 32% uh, replacement factor. We lose about 32% of our EL students in 2020. And this is something that would be helpful um, for us to investigate further uh, and for us to learn and more about and understand why we are seeing this churn um, and what we can do to plan for it and uh, better support our, our students and staff around these uh, significant shifts that we always see but are seeing more so in the last couple of years. Um, and while enrollments may be smaller, We've also had an increase in challenging behaviors, SEL supports for students and instructional supports for students. Um, and of course we have that higher number of private and homeschool enrollments. That's another area of investigation perhaps or opportunity, if you will, um, for us to be thinking about in different and new ways. Uh, and then in the post pandemic period, the question becomes how do we resource ourselves for this over longer periods of time. Okay. Okay. So I'll stop sharing for the moment and I'll do my best to field any questions that you folks may have. Uh, sure, Val, right ahead. Yeah, so just a couple. The first is I, my recollection is, is that middle school is always the place where we see the most um, transfer out to, to private school? Is this year significantly higher than past years for middle school rates? So um, we do always see a high rate for middle school. That is correct. Um, I think the bigger anomaly that I saw this year um, in the slides that you have, um, you can see that there was a large movement in seventh grade. That's unusual. Sixth grade, quite common because there's many independent schools that begin in grade six. And of course, we see a big movement for grade nine for folks who are choosing private high schools. Uh, but there was a we, we lost 20 students to private school in uh, grade seven um, and four to homeschool in grade seven as well. So that's a pretty significant that's more than a, a classroom's worth of, of students who we lost to private school. So uh, that was unusual. So I'll ask a question, Megan, what, what have you learned from this that will help us in projecting numbers for next year? What, what are we thinking? So projecting numbers is going to be extremely difficult for next year um, because of the volatility that we are still seeing. Uh, we did inquire to our, uh, the, the, the Cropper McGibbons folks um, uh, over the last you know, 24 hours or so, asking them what they thought about projections. Um, and they too feel that doing any sort of projections is going to be extremely challenging, um, especially given the fact that we've really only gained you know, 100 COVID um, returns out of the 700 we lost. Uh, things are definitely not settled enough for the district to do sort of a forecast series for them. Um, so. I think what we've learned is that things are regrouping, but we're not there yet. It's not reliable. <laughs> Sorry, I have um, another one. Helen and then Val. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think we've learned we can't project, <laughs> you know, it's just, there, there's just too many factors that, that can play into this. Uh, and, well, uh, but what I did want to ask you is, so how many international students have you registered for this year? Mm. Do, new international students, obviously. That I don't have handy for you. Um, oh. More than last year, for sure. Yeah. Um, but it was not the vast majority of our new enrollments, right? So it wasn't uh, heavily weighted towards it. everybody was international of those 500 plus students that we registered. Um, very many domestic families and a lot of families came back to us, a lot of mm -hmm. re-enrollments um, in that piece, which it was fun. It was fun to welcome families back actually. And how know, many and students came back to the high school? This year? Um, so let's see, 40, 60, 80, 90, a little less than 100. Okay, returned from 12. Oh no, I don't know how many uh, were re-enrolls because that, that's a complicated calculus. They may have been gone since second grade and come back for ninth grade. Um, but we had 100 new students. 100 new high school students. Okay. Yeah. Val? Um, so could you estimate from that large jump that we made downward, uh, how many of those were international families? Just wondering if we are looking at forecasting, this year may not be a great year, but if we have a sense of how many come for a fellowship year or, you know, two years. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I don't actually bit. know, um, uh, our, our data wasn't as clean for the, the 2000. 19 to 20, that, that big dip. Um, but I can tell you of the students who withdrew at the end of last school year um, to now, um, we had 198 students withdrew out of Massachusetts. Uh, and I did break that down for us. 117 of those students went international and 85 were domestic moves. So a bigger proportion left the US then stayed within the US. Yeah, I, I guess I, my, my question is more about if we have any model to forecast, not for, not for this year, because I don't think it's not gonna be normal, but for 22 to 23, for a normal medical academic or other academic year, uh, how many we, we may anticipate, generally speaking, in, a, in any given academic year? I don't think we've ever tracked that in specific terms. Um, and it can experientially, it varies drastically just based on if the if one particular university offers a particular fellowship one year, all of a sudden we have 30 new kids um, that we normally wouldn't have. So it's not a super reliable forecasting feature either. Um, but the ability for families to come versus not being able to come, I think is going to make a big difference. Andy and then Susan. Yeah, I mean, to follow up with Val, I, I, I'm not sure I'm thinking about this the right way, but um, it does seem like um, most of that huge drop in enrollment we saw is not people who left us, but people who in a normal year would have come to us, but did not, right? Because if you compare now with pre-pandemic, we're down 850 overall. But privates, but residents of Brookline who are in private school or homeschool, like that has risen by 250 or so. So that leaves 600 unaccounted for, right? And so those are people who they didn't leave us, but but you know they, they didn't come either. And that seems to be the gap. Am I am I interpreting this right, Megan? Yeah, that that was the really uh, specific thing that we did notice that is unique uh, that we are seeing is that that homeschool private school. Um, folks who are remaining in the town of Brookline but are not choosing public education for their children. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right. We always lose families. You know, that, that's just the nature of how our term works. Families will come for a year or two. We just were not able to replace them in the way that we normally do. So that's actually a very apt way of putting it. Um, there was just an impossibility of replacement, um, which will slowly grow over time. And will also be restricted by, you know, housing and uh, real estate, as it always is. Susan and then Helen. 
Yeah, so thank you for this, Megan. This is always a fun one to try to get our heads around. Um, I had a couple questions. One is just on the one that says Brookline residents, non-PSD, um, the number of children attending private school. Am I correct in reading it that that's the last one? The last bar is January of 21. That's not this year, right? Correct. We don't have that uh, officially slated out just yet, I believe. Yeah, that's so when, always reported in January. Okay, so sorry, just so I know. So for this school year that we're in right now, 21 to 22, when and how do we, when do we get that inform, when do we get that information as a district and how? Uh, we get it through the state. So after we submit our, well, we've submitted and certified our October 1 enrollment. So what the state does was collect, it collects all the information um, from every district across the Commonwealth. And then we also um, actually in collaboration with our Office of Student Services do some um, reaching out to other schools in the Commonwealth to see where our residents are. So uh, as part of a requirement, if there are students that come to your school that do not live in your district or your town, you are supposed to inform the school district. So if we have kids in private school, they're supposed to inform us that our residents are there. So there's a lot of calculation that goes into making those lists and making sure they're accurate. Um, and so it's a combination of our SIMS, which is our October 1 enrollment that was certified last week. Um, and then all the information that we gather from different private schools um, uh, during probably like the month of December. Got it. And so I'm just trying to figure out what we think that number is going to be for this January. Um, like, if I'm hearing you right, it's going to be something in the more like the 1500 range than the 1300 range. Is that right? That would be my guess. I mean, we certainly have. So when students withdraw from Brookline, we have the information that Megan showed around where what they're withdrawing for, what their reason is. Um, but there also could be folks that moved into town that we that never enrolled in our schools that show up in a private school. So those would um, those students get added to the numbers that we have from our Sims database. Um, but I would venture to guess that it would be around the 1500 and not back down to that 1300. And so just on that, if we just one more follow up, if we think about the withdrawal analysis, do we have any idea? And I think you may have started to answer this for Helen's questions. I just might not have gotten it, but the new students enrolled, do we know how many of those are our students who left for a year and are coming back versus brand new people? I don't have like a specific number, uh, as I said, for, for Helen. Um, it, it, was, it was very difficult because I didn't meet all 588 myself. I did meet most of them, but not all of them. Um, <laughs> we didn't, do we ask them how long they've lived in Brookline or do we? No, so we don't ask them how long they live in Brookline. Um, okay. So there can, we have, we always have families who go back and forth and ping pong, uh, a yo-yo okay. between private and public. Um, and they get totally new Aspen, totally new XP record numbers, whatever, tracers. No, so their student ID numbers, if they, their, their state ID numbers, if they have one, they stay. Um, so we have those. Uh, so we can figure that yeah. out then. How many of the 588 reactivated their number or something? something we'd have to do a little bit of uh, work okay. to, to dive down. And, and I'm just do trying that. to figure out if like, I'm, I'm just on this churn, I'm on this churn idea because we do have such churn on a regular basis. I'm, just, I'm trying to figure out the different pieces of the churn and whether or not the churn we're seeing is essentially the churn we've always seen or if it's actually different um, because we've always seen a lot of churn. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we, we always see a lot of churn. Um, I will say we saw more students returning to us after a one year break in private school for their, their COVID year because they had different choices that they needed to make for their students based on what we were able to provide at the opening right. of school last September, right. didn't work for them, their needs, whatever. Um, that was a higher proportion than usual. Um, Got it. For sure. But we just don't have enough, we don't have numbers, but that's a, just- I don't have a hard you. number on that. Got it, okay, okay, thanks. Helen? So uh, to the best of my recollection in the past, our private school student number percentage was pretty consistent and it was around 13% is my recollection. 
Um, I think it went down a little bit when our numbers went up in population, obviously because you know, that might have been held more constant, but our numbers went up. Uh, but I think what would be interesting in January, and I, I, now that we, ha we have these norms that we ask the superintendent to ask, I won't ask the staff, but I'll ask the superintendent if it might be possible to sort of get a little better understanding of the private school um, population in terms of both the, the percentages over the years, you know, let's say for the last 20 years or something like that. And I think we have those numbers easily accessible. I don't think it's, it's, it's pretty hard to, to find that. But the other piece that I always found interesting is that a, a large percentage of our private school students were parochial stu school students, both uh, Catholic and Jewish parochial schools. And that you know sort of also is something that I think is important for us to know because that's not something we're gonna be able to provide you know, that's, that's a parent choosing a different type of education totally for their children. But, you know, the private school is a little different piece. So yeah, if it's possible to break that out, um, you know, that would be, I think, you know, interesting for the committee to know that. Yeah, Helen, just so you know, the way that the school attending report comes out, they link uh, in-state private and parochial together. So um, we used to get a list of names with the school next to it. I remember seeing that at one time. Yeah, back when we had kindergartens of like 200 kids. I mean, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no. I mean, that's definitely how we report the numbers, but it's um, the way that the state gives it to us, it'll, they lump them together. So um, it's not, you know, as easy as just like clicking basically what I just did to pull up to ensure that I was right in my statement that they lump them together. Um, which took two seconds, but and you know, pulling apart parochial from private might be um, more challenging. I had a question about our Medco students. Are we consistent with our Medco students? Has that gone up or down? Did we lose students over the pandemic? For the most part, that is we we have kept that steady. I mean, the individual students we have lost some individual students, but they have been replaced with other new students. Uh, to have that opportunity to be members of our community here. And is there, I don't know, is there some thought that we could host additional Medco students if our numbers stay low? I mean, I, I mean I, I'm just throwing it out. I'm not having that conversation right now, but I'm just throwing it out there. Our numbers are quite a bit lower than they were um, a while ago. So something to think No, about. they're the same, I think. No, our METCO are the same, but our, our total student population is low. Susan? Um, just one other question. We don't need it for right this minute, but if we have numbers on the percentages of kids who are um, economically disadvantaged or um, ELL or uh, you know, students with disabilities, it would be helpful because that, it would be good to know to whatever extent these numbers are seeing proportionate declines um, by population or, and, and race actually, you know, or whether we're seeing proportionate declines by population or disproportionate declines. And if so, that will change our, if, if they're disproportionate, it will change our percentages of students with IEPs or students, um, free, you know, former, what used to be called free and reduced lunch. Um, so I think that would be helpful to know also if our percentages have changed. I believe that um, when, as soon as Desi publishes this data publicly, that information will be part of that. Erin, you can verify it on, off my rocker on that one, but I think the, those are all included in the, the breakdowns that they'll publish short, whenever they feel that they have everybody certified the way they need to. Well, okay. Yeah, just a small, small number of students, but a technical question. Um, out of district students, are they captured in our main number or are they listed as private school students? So they are not captured in our, um, oct they're captured in our October, October one as non-district students. So services only essentially. So they're not counted in the 6929 that we presented, but we do submit them. Okay. Uh, we do keep track of them. Thank you. 
do we get per pupil reimbursement for them? Are you asking about um, circuit breaker? No, I'm talking about just regular student, you know, what we get from the state per pupil. Oh, that I don't know. I believe they're counted in our foundation enrollment uh, to answer that. So, so I would believe the answer is yes. Okay. Okay, anything else on enrollment? Uh, I suppose we'll need an update at some point, Megan, I'm not sure when, but um, yeah. I mean, it gets tricky for the, you know, for budgeting purposes, right, Sam, what kind of numbers we're talking about, so. Yeah, I can, I know uh, I was on the phone and I heard someone ask a question about um, projections and I know Megan spoke to you all about um, the conversation, quick conversation that we had with uh, Cropper and McGibbon who did that demographic study for us a few years back, um, who indicated that they weren't really recommending any any real demographic um, study similar to what we had done before. What I've heard from other data directors um, around our different communities is that they are either going to go with the um, uh, cohort survival, which is what we used to do for our projections um, and do some sort of average three to five year average of kindergarten um, instead of the birth rates. Um, some are using birth rates. It really depends on how good our census data is. Um, and that varies from year to year in our town, I think. Um, so we'll look into both of those. Um, but my recommendation probably will be to do the cohort survival. Um, we also are members of NESDEC who, because we are members, we get, uh, I'll say free <laughs> um, enrollment projections from them. So once our October 1 data is submitted to them, they, they will turn that over to us as well. Normally their numbers are a little bit lower actually um, than we project, uh, which we had seen in the past, um, but that's just another data point that we can use. Andy? I was wondering, do we have any kind of demographic peer districts in the sense of other districts that have this sort of international level of international churn that, that Brookline has, or are we kind of unique in that regard? I mean, Megan could probably speak better to this um, based on her colleagues and other um, registration offices. But from what I see, we're pretty unique, especially in the districts that we normally, you know, compare ourselves to. If you look at our churn rates are around 10% and in our EL population, it's really high around 30%, somewhere between 20 and 30%. Um, and so it's really hard. We have a really hard time comparing. Uh, finding a comparison district when we're thinking about specifically about enrollment and this turn uh, even even more so in this COVID time. I mean, the closest might maybe, maybe Cambridge has a, they're the most uh, likely district to have any sort of similarities. Our demographic proportions are off um, across our districts, but we have similar populations, but the proportions just the balance is a little bit different. So they, they also have a pretty decent churn, um, but not quite as high as ours, I don't think. And Newton? Newton and Lexington, they would be the other two that might. No, they're much more stable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just quickly looked up Cambridge's um, churn in the last, in 2020, 9% and their LE, our EL population, 28%. So that's, um, probably an accurate comparison in terms of churn rate, though obviously different demographics um, of community. Okay, thank you, Megan. Thank you, Erin. We appreciate it. We'll be in touch, I'm sure. So thank you. Thank you. We are gonna move on to subcommittee and liaison reports. And uh, who has a report for us? Uh, Jennifer, then Helen. Just going to give a quick quick update about an upcoming meeting that we have. Uh, we have a curriculum meeting on Tuesday, November sixteenth, from four to five thirty p.m. Uh, we'll be reviewing meeting minutes, an update on the Office of Teaching and Learning goals, an update on the RFP for middle school review, um, and a presentation on literacy, teaching, and learning. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Helen, and then Mariah. 
So we have a lot of work happening in Capitol, uh, not so much on the committee. We unfortunately had to cancel our meeting um, that we were going to, have. we usually have our meetings the second Tuesday of the month. Um, but Charlie Simmons has been out uh, for a number of months now. And our uh, main piece that we need to discuss is the CIP. Uh, so uh, at this point, it seems to me, since Charlie won't be back until December, we probably should just wait for our next meeting to have that meeting um, rather than trying to schedule a meeting and then not be able to have it. Uh, because the main <clears throat> actor is not there. Um, in addition, uh, I have some good news uh, with Pierce School. We have this, the school building committee on Monday voted uh, for the um, um, preferred uh, um, schematic design um, uh, building. And uh, we voted to have the uh, what was called the 3BH or the new building uh, with the bridge to the historic building using the historic building. Um, it was, there were some very good conversations about all the options, uh, uh, about sustainability, about um, functioning as a school, transition times and, um, uh, you know, and basically the two, uh, we voted a few, a month back to eliminate two of the um, um, plans that incorporated the existing building because it could not meet what, what we have as our educational plan. Um, we did keep uh, two in the mix and uh, we will be getting a presentation to the school committee uh, of the uh, plans that, um, probably of both plans, but of, of the plan that we chose and the sustainability issues that we're looking at there. We are looking at geothermal and at uh, uh, um, uh, photovoltaics on the um, roof. Um, uh, the photovoltaics will be for sure. The geothermal we're, we're exploring, exploring right now. So uh, things are moving forward. We will have a... Um, uh, a submission to the MSBA of the preferred schematic design, which will go in in December. Uh, the school building committee will have to vote it. And um, hopefully we, this will then be approved in the March uh, meeting. Um, we won't be sitting on our laurels waiting for March. We'll probably be going ahead with uh, design uh, between the time that um, we submit and when hopefully we will get approval. We have been submitting things all along with them. So we're fairly confident that things are going in the right direction. Um, and um, all that to say that we would hope that by next fall, we would be ready with a, um, uh, a design and a uh, price tag that we could bring to the voters um, uh, for a vote and to town meeting for uh, approval for, for the borrowing. Mm -hmm. So, um, and if all goes well, 2024 would probably be when, which one should, uh, help me, Andy, which, what was the date that we were going to put a shovel in the ground? I think it was 2024. Yeah, because there's then construction, uh, design develop, uh, what's that called? Not design development. Um, construction documents that need to be done for the following year after the vote. And then 2024, so September 2024, we would put a shovel in the ground and hopefully within two years we'd be able to open a new peer school. So um, I don't know if Susan wants to put some, um, add some things about Driscoll and about uh, the high school. Uh, Driscoll, Driscoll, there's a really, really big oh, hole in yeah, the ground. Yeah. <laughs> if you haven't driven by the Driscoll Hole, I really suggest you do so. It's enormous. You can't like you see these pictures and it looks like they're little like Lego people. And it looks like they're like, you know, the stop and shop uh, cakes with like little, you know, piles of Oreos, you know, cookies and and little plastic dump trucks there. You look at the pictures and people are this tiny and they're in these giant holes. So I really do 
recommend you drive by it. Um, but uh, they lost a couple days because of the rains, so kind of washing things out, but got back on track. And um, right now um, they're doing um, some soil remediation. Um, they found some uh, soils a number of a couple of months ago. And so they're working on trying to find a place for that. Um, well, they found a place. They're working on kind of getting it there. Um, we were already having some soil remediation going and they're basically sending a whole lot more. Um, and then the only other interesting thing is that um, the the way that the um, the timing is working, um, the students um, are being able are are able at some they're, they're trying to find a time for the students to be able to kind of more um, in a more profound way sort of see and and interact with the construction site. Um, but since I'm not the project co-chair anymore, I will turn it over to Val, um, who <laughs> might have uh, more uh, information. Um, uh, well, the only other thing I'll say is due to Val's advocacy and Miriam's, um, we now have um, weekly updates um, going out to the community from the construction managers. Um, it's something they do on other projects and it's something that's making the community quite happy. So way to make an impact um, right out of the gate, Val. I have to apologize to you, Val. I should have called on you and not Susan for Driscoll. That's quite all right. Su Susan just gave a great update and the, the um, communication piece has been, I, I think, really impactful for um, folks who don't necessarily have students at Driscoll but live um, in the neighborhood, so. And the high school? The high school, um, there was a, an extensive update recently um, and the couple couple things. One is that uh, for 22 Tappan, um, it is still on track to be turned over in January. Um, they have been told, I don't know how many times by myself, Matt, Sam, Hal, we've all been really very clear that um, MLK Day weekend is sort of a hard, hard stop because the term turns over the following week and if it's not open by then, there's just gonna be a lot of chaos trying to schedule it for OLS and then move people halfway through term. Uh, so they have that laser in their sights um, and are paying a lot of attention to that. And they're working on finishes and flooring um, and interior glass and that sort of thing. And what we said to them was, uh, you know, there may be a room or two that can't be opened if the white box isn't ready, but everything else is ready. We said, you know, that's fine, We need, we, but we need the building. Um, so they're, they're quite clear on that. Um, we got an update on the field also. Um, if you've driven by it, you've seen um, that it's seated. Um, I guess the playground equipment is coming in soon, but they don't have, the crumb rubber is back ordered. So they're kind of dealing with a whole lot of supply chain issues that you've probably heard about in other places, um, as is the Driscoll project, by the way. So there's a lot of conversation about like like one little piece kind of being meaning you can't finish the entire room. So like porcelain is a problem, toilet stall dividers is a problem. There are all kinds of things that are um, or crumb rubber um, for the play field, for the uh, for the playground is a problem. So anyway, there there was a lot of discussion about those kinds of things and how do you kind of keep going when one piece is is out of um, out of commission or two months late. Um, but other than that, you know, things are still trucking along. They're also working on the opening it, uh, sooner rather than later. I don't know if you remember, but if you're kind of at the high school across the street, there used to be kind of a plaza between the high school and then Greeno. There was a plaza before you got to the field. And that plaza not only was well used, but also um, is really important when snow removal season starts to happen. So they've managed to figure out walking routes, even without um, the bridge across um, the T track. So they used to go down, you probably know, they used to go down Emerson and then they would cross um, on that bridge, but that bridge doesn't exist anymore. So they've had to reroute the kids. But the problem is now the kids are on pretty narrow sidewalks. And so um, DPW and uh, the you know Commissioner Galantine is you know ahead of it, well aware of it. Um, and they're trying to accelerate different pieces of the field project so that we have more sidewalk to put snow on so that the kids can have sidewalk to walk on. So anyway, it's it's all these things that are, are cascading effects, um, but they're all getting discussed and, and worked through. So so we're we're still going in tonight. We voted the um, the eminent domain piece, which was really an important piece of the puzzle um, to to nail down for our for budgetary purposes. So um, lots of lots of good news to report. And the T station, have they said when they're opening that? Uh, the tea station is supposed to open in December, I want to say. I'm not 100% sure. It's supposed to open this year. Um, 
it was gonna it was either the end of November or beginning of December. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that's uh, enough construction for now. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, very you. Much. Thank you team. Uh, Mariah. So um, as I mentioned, we discussed, I think at our last meeting, we were going to um, start to uh, uh, a process by which um, a member of the school committee, in this case, me, was um, looking at the uh, the non-personnel warrant, which is basically the, the bills that need to get paid. This is something that's um, required in the school ed reform. Um, and Sam and I had been working on this since I think even before Sam started about getting this um, uh, process um, worked into the process of the accounts payable um, of the schools in town, which is obviously very um, complex. And so um, starting three weeks ago, I've been going in once a week to look at bills. And um, just the report on that is that so far I've looked at $2,328,396.12 in bills in three weeks. Um, and I'm obviously not going to describe in great detail <laughs> Um, what I've seen, <laughs> um, but it's been really helpful to, um, to have the opportunity to see, you know, so much of what you would imagine, um, are the bills or exactly what you think they are. It's, um, you know, anything from a box of pencils to a $200,000 bus transportation bill for a month, um, and, and anything in between. Um, and so, um, it's been valuable to be part of that process and to be um, speaking with Sam about that and getting um, another lens into the, the working um, of, the, of the town, of the uh, finance office. Thank you, Mariah. Yeah. And, oh, can I actually just make one more comment about it? Um, sure. Susan, I think at a previous meeting had you know, mentioned just making sure that there was a value add to this. And I, I think that there, there are, so far there has been, it's been helpful to um, have the opportunity to discuss, you know, so many of the transactions are sort of um, very mundane, but there's opportunities when a transaction is perhaps a little bit more unusual to discuss it and, um, and sort of have that buy-in. And it's helpful in terms of, um, um, I feel like having school committee, um, a representative from school committee um, understand and and um, and also buy in on that. It's just I think it's valuable to have that sort of all the way up and down the chain. So I'm, I think it is. Well, it's relatively time intensive. Um, it's been about an hour, an hour and a half a week so far. I think that that is um, it has been valuable, and I think it's great that we've started this process. Thank you, Mariah, for doing that. Appreciate it, Andy. Uh, yeah, thanks, Suzanne. I can give a brief uh, update on negotiations. Um, so since our last school committee meeting, uh, the negotiations team has met twice with the BEU. That was on October 27th and November 3rd. Uh, we presented our offers for Unit A teachers and Unit B uh, administrators. So the salary proposals for the two units are largely the same, and we've already described uh, some of the main points of the Unit A proposal in a public statement back on October 28th. Uh, for those who didn't read that, um, I'll just repeat part of what we said in the statement. So um, we're proposing a 6% cost of living increase over three years. Um, so this increase is on top of the contractual steps that provide annual raises for most educators uh, based on their years of experience. And for educators who have already reached uh, the top of the pay scale, we were offering uh, an additional 10% increase to the longevity uh, supplements that they currently receive. A um, couple other items in our proposal, um, a joint committee that we meet over the next year to discuss working conditions uh, with the intent of accelerating future negotiations. And also we're proposing to extend the uh, workday for K-8 teachers from currently six hours, 20 minutes to six hours, 50 minutes. Um, this would be to align K-8 through with the high school. And most importantly, um, the purpose of this is to make sure that teachers are present uh, for 10 minutes before and after the kids are there for the school day. 
Um, so our intent in, in this proposal was to be sort of student focused and respectful of the educators um, while also acknowledging the financial situation that's facing the town. So we are meeting with the BEU again on uh, November 18th um, to hear their responses to our offers. Thank you, Andy. Uh, anyone else have reports? David? Yesterday, the policy subcommittee met and we discussed several policies. We uh, discussed the, the uh, policy to support students who are transgender and or gender non-conforming, which we addressed earlier in today's meeting when we received the student representative report. We also discussed the foundations and basic commitments policy around the end. We also voted to refer uh, the draft policy on that to the full school committee. We'll probably be taking that up at a full committee shortly. Essentially, what we were aiming to accomplish there is to add language that would uh, guarantee access to services in addition to a commitment to non-discrimination with students and with employees. We also discussed a draft revision of the facilities development policy that was also largely motivated around uh, gender equity. Uh, as well as 504 plan and IEP uh, accommodation equity. Then we had a discussion on access to school buildings. This brought a lot of uh, public comment. Uh, we heard from several members of the community. I would say that the vast majority of them, if not all of them, expressed support for more open access to school buildings. So that's going to be an ongoing uh, discussion that we continue to have. Uh, and then we also discuss briefly next steps on review and revision of the restraint and seclusion policy. Uh, at minimum, we want to, as soon as possible, bring our policy up to current state standards so that we're in compliance. And then um, over a longer term period of time, address what we would like to see as sort of the normative policy of what it is that we want to do above the minimum that's going to require a lot of uh, thoughtful input from staff, and it's going to take time, of course, to assess where we are currently at. Uh, but in the meantime, we can certainly at least bring our policy into alignment with state law. Um, and the policy subcommittee will next meet on the second Monday of December. Thank you, David. Uh, anyone else? Yes, Susan. Um, I had the pleasure of attending the BHS Innovation Fund board meeting this week, um, and they have a lot of very exciting activities going on. Um, they're starting to return to regular pre-pandemic events. Um, they're trying to just go back to normal as much as possible and adjust as they go with indoor-outdoor and finding ways to just be creative. But they're planning to do their winter appeal again. They're planning to... Um, and they've had some successful events already with new parents. They're doing more events um, in the spring, kind of rising eighth grade, rising ninth graders in the spring. Um, they are thinking about a gala for this year um, and also a dinner. Um, they're thinking about an educational focus event. So there are a number of different things that they're excited about and that the educators are excited about also in terms of um, getting back into the swing of things um, with programming from the fund. So um, they've been working all along and they've um, also had a presentation on the work that they did to support the new high school um, buildings, um, educators um, using the new high school buildings in a powerful way, um, and also um, thinking through what are the different uh, think responses to pandemic that, um, that teachers need to, to support them. So all in all, they've been very busy and it um, sounds like they're gonna get busier which is great. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, Lai, is there anything else you wanna say before we go into executive session? Is there anything else you wanna? Nope, I think we've uh, covered it to the same. Okay. So I move to meet an executive session pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A for the following purposes. Purpose three, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the Brookline Educators Union, BEU Unit A and Unit B, and to discuss strategy with respect to, uh, no, not that one. Uh, 
If an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining and litigating positions of the public body and the chair so declares, and purpose seven, to review and approve executive session minutes from the following meeting, October 21st, 2021. Uh, do I have a second to that? Thank you, Andy. Uh, we'll vote to go into executive session. David? Yes. Val? Yes. Susan? Yes. Jennifer? Yes. Helen? Yes. Andy? Yes. Stephen? Yes. Mariah? Yes. And I vote yes as well. And uh, we will not be coming back to an open session. So um, good night to the public. And I will see school committee members uh, in executive session in just a few minutes. <laughs>